Good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming out to the Warren Committee tonight. We have a, a packed room here with a, a lot of people who want to give some feedback on the non-contingent budget, which I, which I understand. Uh, but we have a long discussion ahead of us this evening. And what I would propose is that a couple of people reached out to me in advance to, to speak for three minutes each, and we're going to try to cycle through those folks as fast as possible. And my suggestion would be that after we discuss the vacant Warren Committee seat, we invite each person up who wants to speak, and then we move on from that portion of the evening, and we start our Warren Committee dialogue that we had planned to have this evening. I don't think it will be productive for us to continue to have sort of an open forum hearing for the entire evening. The Warren Committee typically doesn't have a public speak section, so I'm doing this because I know that there are plenty of people who want to give feedback, but um, I think that we need to consolidate it to the beginning part of the meeting, if at all possible. Does anybody have any concerns about that approach? No? All right, so um, may we begin with a review and possible approval of the minutes? <laughs> Motion to approve minutes from February 22nd. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? All those in favor? Eight, any abstaining? <coughs> One? Okay. Two. 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 Thank you. Late hand. Two abstaining. All right. Well, why don't we discuss the vacant Warren Committee seat for a couple of minutes? We, we started this discussion last week. We spent just a few minutes on it because I recognized that there were a couple of people who weren't here that wanted to be here for the discussion. So um, several members spoke up and, and suggested that we postpone that. So I'd like to hear where people's thoughts are on this. We have two people who have been suggested to us. One is Phil Matthews, who was on the board, the uh, Warren Committee previously and stepped off uh, last year. And the other person uh, is the husband of Mary Lou Asher, and he had been tracking, both of them had been tracking along with the meetings at home. Um, we could choose to nominate and um, second and vote on one or both of them. Um, or we could choose to not fill the seat. There's nothing that says that we have to have a full slate. Um, and indeed, two years ago, I think we had four openings when we got, by the time we got to town meeting. Um, it may be your opinion at this point um, that it's too late to be adding another voice to this discussion given where we are in the voting process, but I'd like to hear what people's opinions are. Um, I'd like to nominate Phil Matthews to fill the vacancy through, town, through the time of the town meeting or through July 1st. And what I said last week when a lot of folks weren't here is that you know, Phil also listens to the Warren Committee meetings online and um, has chatted with me a couple of times about some of the budgetary issues. So he is very knowledgeable about the budget. So I think he could really be very helpful from now on in because we are late in the process. And I think he would be an excellent addition at this late hour. So I would like to nominate him to be um, added to the committee. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Let's have some discussion. Yeah, so, um, Mark? Yeah, uh, I, I think Mary Lou's letter had indicated um, a certain level of continuity that she could help provide uh, if her husband were to be uh, put in, in her place mm -hmm. and, um, you know, just encourage the body, I think, to, uh, to consider that. I think that that's valuable, particularly, you know, subcommittee meetings that we have that you can't follow along at home. And um, if there's some continuity there that she's been able to provide him that um, another person might not uh, have access to, I think that's uh, a very valuable thing to consider. Mm -hmm. Listen, oh, go ahead, Brian. I just think we're too far along in the process to bring a new voice in personally. No one will dispute, certainly not me, that Phil has tremendous institutional knowledge. He's been a part of this table for many years. Uh, I'm just of the belief that we're the ones who we've been here from the start. We've had it's one thing to watch the meetings and follow them. It's another to be in this room, <coughs> sit face to face with people. I just, I think we're pretty late in the game to bring a new voice in. We have a lot on our plates right now. We have a lot of energy to make some really difficult decisions and to spend, burn any cycles on recapping, going back to information that we think is baseline that we've gone over four or five months ago, I think might be counterproductive. So that's just my two cents. I tend to agree with that. Yep. Uh, question: would, Is it Phil's intention, if he were to be voted onto the committee, to stay only through July yes. 1st? It was his intention, as he said to me, to just help us get to July 1st if we needed the help. Okay. Maggie. Just a comment: uh, do, do the members feel that we need additional help? I guess is a good 
question? Oh, why don't you talk about your situation? Okay. Yeah, yeah, well, one additional complication is that um, many of you know that I am not actually going to be able to be at town meeting for the first couple of days because I'm going to be, unfortunately, out of the country. So we won't have a full slate even if we had 15 members. Um, and this is something that we can discuss at a later time at another meeting. Brian has offered to be acting chair and Steve has offered to be acting secretary to help run um, the Warren Committee table at town meeting if you all um, approve of that plan and want to vote that uh, to happen. You could of course just vote in your chair as well if you wanted to and just make a permanent change. Um, but that is something that you might want to keep in mind as you make your decision that I'm not going to be able to be there. Brian is also going to be out of the country with me. Unfortunately, I made a mistake when I booked this trip and didn't realize the date of town meeting. So Brian's looking at flying back early so he can be there for the planning board stuff, but I will still be out of the country until probably night five of town meeting, which unfortunately I think we will see this year. Other discussion on the uh, motion on the table? How do people feel generally about adding another person to the? Yes. I think we've we've all been in this together right now, and I think we've all shared our thoughts, and and um, we all have very we all have a, a very uh, educated opinion of what's going to happen, and I think too much has I I, I think we can handle it. I think the group that we have here has handled it and I think we can handle it. And I think I'm okay with this. I'm okay with this. Okay. Anybody else before we call for a vote? Um, the only question yes. is, would we, is it potential we could deadlock if we're at number 14? Are we gonna have? If, if I'm not a town meeting and we have 14 members? You mean? Right. Could we hit some seven to seven votes? That's, oh. that's possible, but somebody's going to be acting chair, and so the chair generally votes last or, or abstains from voting. So if the, it's unlikely that there would be. The chair won't vote to create a tie. Okay. Or shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, anything else? So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen people here. Um, all those in favor of Betty's motion of bringing Phil, uh, or of approving Phil's nomination to join the Warren Committee? Seven. All those opposed? Four. Staining? Anything? So the motion carries. Um, somebody wants to text Phil if he wants to come over and join us, he can. He can't vote tonight until he's sworn in, but he's welcome to join us. <clears throat> There's no room, but... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. One more chair over there. Yeah. All right. All right, so we have a packed room, plenty of people. Um, I had many people reach out to me. We're moving into the non-contingent discussion now. Um, is that Allison Zukowski here? Hi, Allison. Um, Allison is the one of the PTO leadership members from Collicott, and she asked to speak. Mike Zulis is here, and he asked to speak. Uh, is Linda Lee Sheridan here? Hi, Linda Lee. Linda Lee is a former school committee member and asked to speak. Um, Jack Grant is here and he asked to speak. And uh, Katie Conlin and Michael Dennehy were going to be on the agenda anyway, so they both asked to speak as well. I'd propose that we run through in that order and let me ask at this point, is there anybody else who wishes to address the non-contingent budget discussion? All right, I'll ask again after we run through that list, but hopefully we won't have too many folks. Allison, do you want to come up and join us at the table? Um, as Allison makes her way up, if, uh, if you don't mind me mentioning, <clears throat> we have a $1.5 million shortfall in our budget, and we are going to have to make cuts to department budgets somewhere, somehow, and uh, we understand that people's jobs are going to be impacted, and it is a difficult decision, and so we appreciate you just keeping what's on our plate in mind as you make your comments. Um, I actually want to start by saying thank you for allowing me to speak. I understand how difficult this is um, to make these decisions. I would not want to be in your position right now. Um, but after going through, I'm the PTO chair at Collicott. I am a mother of three. I have two currently in Collicott and one who will be in preschool shortly. And um, after seeing the budget presentations, myself as well as many of the other parents were very concerned at the amount that was be the school was being asked 
to decrease their budget by. Um, $1.2 million is a very, very large number for anybody's budget. We understand that we're the biggest department in the school and that inevitably we are going to get quite a bit of the cuts, but we also feel that that number is extremely large. And we've heard lots of talk about <coughs> possible override and a lot of us feel that if we're going to be asked to do the work for an override that the school needs to be, not be the only department that is feeling the brunt of these hits. Um, I don't think, and many other parents that I have talked to do not feel that a override would pass if, if that was the case. Um, considering most of the, a lot of parents, not most, a lot of parents and definitely not all are going to be the ones who would do the legwork on an override because they feel very passionately about their children's education and the, the state of the schools that they will voluntarily do a lot of the legwork for an override if that is the way the warrant committee and town meeting and the selectmen decide to go and would do so very happily. But we feel like the budget cuts need to be a little more equitably sh shared between the other departments. Nobody wants to have cuts to their budgets and rightfully so. Everybody needs their what they're asking for. Nobody is frivolously asking for more than what they need. Um, so we would just like to ask very respectfully that you consider that when approving the budget that we try to be as equitable across the board in cuts as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody have any questions for Allison? Thanks for coming, Allison. Mike, do you want to come up? Yes, sir. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee. Um, uh, back in the day when I was on this committee, we, we never drew crowds like this, so I don't know if that means you're doing something right or something wrong. <laughs> Thank you. That's um, helpful for you. <laughs> um, let me acknowledge, um, preface my remarks by acknowledging that, um, that I don't know nearly as much about the intricacies of the FY18 budget as everyone seated at this table. However, there are uh, at least one aspect of the non-contingent budget of what's been claimed about the non-contingent budget that um, I thought it better to raise in this venue rather than on the floor of town meeting for the first time. Um, I too am concerned about the allocation of the deficit, uh, but I recognize that um, you all have a very tough chore ahead because there are needs across the board. And so my only ask with respect to the allocation of the deficit is that you provide town meeting with a clear, fair, reasonable justification for whatever that allocation of the deficit is so that we can make a judgment at town meeting. Um, and more to the point, um, I've observed a claim about the school administrative costs, that they are too high. And this is something that I can speak with some background on. Uh, for about two years, up until about 10 months ago, I chaired this group known as the Town School Consolidation Committee. That school was comprised of Amy Dexter, who was the town accountant, Anne Marie Tannen, who was then the uh, town administrator, uh, Jimmy McAuliffe, the town treasurer, myself, Glenn Pavlicek, who was the assistant um, superintendent for business, and also Phil Matthews was the citizen participation, participant on that committee. Our charge was to find efficiencies in the town and the school operations. And we looked at staffing levels, we looked at organizational charts, we looked for duplication. And the consensus was that for a $100 million operation, um, staffing, was, staffing levels were pretty thin at administration on both sides of the house, both on the, both on the town and, both on, and on the school. And so what we did was we focused on other efficiencies, new software, uh, paperless payroll, bi-weekly payroll, and also centralized procurement, which I think is going to be come up, come up before town meeting this spring. 
So um, unless there's been an explosion in the hiring of administrative personnel in the schools or the town in the last 10 months, it seems to me that claim is a bit of a canard. Um, and uh, I will say that um, I recognize that you all have a very difficult chore ahead, um, but we do have a pretty good thing going on right now with the schools. And um, every few months or so, a school rating system comes out, and sometimes Milton is higher and sometimes it's lower. But it seems to me a lot of these rankings are very subjective. Um, what is objective is the market supply and demand. And by all accounts, the demand for the Milton Public Schools right now is very high. And anyone in the private sector will tell you that when demand is high, that means that you're providing a good product or a good service. And the fact is, as has been said many times, family mo families move here and they stay, stay here because of the Milton Public Schools. And that keeps our community vibrant, it keeps our property values high, and it keeps them rising. So. Um, I'm sure we'll all do our best to keep that good thing going and not to blow it in the future. Uh, with that, I thank you for your time. Good luck in all your hard work. I don't envy you. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll look forward to your recommendations at town meeting. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Does anybody have any questions for Mike before he goes? No. Thank you for coming in, Michael. <clears throat> Linda Lee, do you want to come in? Linda Lee is a former school committee member, amongst other things in town. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for allowing me to come, Chairman McLean and members of the Warren Committee. I want to start by thanking you for the countless hours and time that you put into this. I know that no decision is made lightly, and I want to thank you for all your work on that. My name is Linda Lee Sheridan. I'm a town meeting member from Precinct 9 and um, served on the Milton School Committee for nine years, stepping down two years ago. Education is my life. I've been a special education teacher and now administrator in um, a neighboring city for 36 years. I come before you tonight to share honestly my shock and dismay with the direction that this budget is going. The way I understand this process, the departments made a request of $3.9 million additional funding, and the town has $2.4 million to spend on these increases. That leaves a $1.5 million deficit to fund our override or to make cuts. What puzzles me is that this seems to be a townwide problem that is being borne in the backs of the schools. How can we continue to make this town the best it can be with the funds that we have? Our school system is a tremendous factor that families consider when moving to Milton. As a matter of fact, we have a 5% increase in students over the past three years. That's an additional 170 students. Ten years ago, when I started on the school committee, we had 20% of our elementary students go to private and parochial schools. Today, that percentage has decreased to 10%. This is a good news story for the town of Milton and the Milton Public Schools. If you build it, they will come. When we create great schools, the students will come, and our schools are now nearing capacity. Special education is an unfunded mandate and has been since its inception. That means that if we have students who are required by law special education services, we are mandated to provide those services. And who wouldn't want to anyway? We are doing right by all students, as we should. Sometimes these students require outside placement, but Milton Public Schools has done an outstanding job at providing these services in-house. That, so that students don't have to travel 40 or 60 minutes um, each way to attend an outside school. It also means that we can absorb that cost internally rather than writing a check to another agency or school district. Ten years ago again when I started on the school committee we had about a hundred students that were out of district. Today we are down to about 50 students. The Milton Public Schools is doing everything they can to save money. However, this special education funding should be treated as a bill, just like any other bill that the town has to pay. The schools are required to provide an additional $650,000 in additional special education costs next year. I understand that the town has broken out the cost of health insurance and treated that like a bill that has to be paid on the town side. Why would you not do that for our special education costs as well? <clears throat> 
Finally, I would like to talk about the equity of the cuts as I see them outlined. The town of Milton has approximately a hundred million dollar budget, of which the schools claim 45 percent of that dollar amount. Please help me understand why they are being asked to take 80 percent of the cuts in this budget. That is not fair nor equitable. Setting up an override where the negative impact is essentially limited to the school department is a recipe for failure. Please don't pit the schools against the town side. Present a budget that is fair for all facets of this community. Thank you for your time. <laughs> Anybody have any questions for Linda Lee? Thanks, Linda Lee. <clears throat> Chief Grant, do you want to come up? What did you say? Did, did you call me? I called Chief Grant. Yeah, I, I was, Amy and I were going to come up and present um, the okay. 525 cuts and how we allocated it. All and right. Turn it over to the department heads for impact statements. That that's, works? that's great. Yeah. Can we hold off on that for a few minutes until sure. we get through any other opening comments? Sure. Yep. That would be great. Thank you. Is there anybody <coughs> else besides um, Chairwoman Conlon from the Board of Selectmen who wanted to address the non contingent budget? <coughs> Katie, do you mind joining? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and members of the Warrant Committee. I came here tonight to talk about free cash. After viewing your last meeting and a discussion about potentially using some free cash, a few hundred thousand dollars of it, I understood, for operating expenses, I did have a conversation with your chair and indicated that I would like to come in and talk with the Warren Committee a little bit about free cash and some of our recent history. But before we get to that, I want to address the situation of this room tonight. I think it's very unfortunate that we have a lot of parents of school children here and a lot of public safety personnel. And, and my remarks right now, because I haven't had a chance to discuss them with the board, I, I'm going to speak on my own behalf. And when I get to free cash, I'll definitely be, on, be speaking on behalf of the board. But my, my colleagues may agree with me on this. I just haven't had a chance to discuss them because I came into this room not expecting to see all of these people. I was expecting to see a room full of school parents because I did receive some correspondence from a member of the school committee encouraging parents to come and ask the warrant committee not to make certain cuts in the school budget. I'm speaking to you right now from the heart as a longtime town meeting member. I got elected to town meeting when I was 19 years old. I have great respect for town meeting and for this institution, the Warrant Committee. Town meeting, aside, we have a representative town meeting. That's the closest thing next to an open town meeting to direct democracy that we can have at any level of government. This is, local government is where People who live in the town can have a say in how their roads are plowed and how much the police budget is funded and how much we spend on education and what kind of zoning we put, on pla put in place. So it's a very, town meeting is a very important institution. It goes back in Milton decades and centuries. We're, we have a very old town meeting. The reason that our town meeting functions as well as it does is because the warrant committee is well respected by town meeting. Town meeting gives substantial deference to recommendations that come from the Warrant Committee. And that's because the Warrant Committee is perceived and believed by town meeting members to be the body that's independent, free from political pressure, and does the homework and the due diligence for the town meeting members. Unlike members of Congress and unlike state legislators, our legislature, which is the town meeting, they don't have staffs, they don't have committee meetings, they rely, they and we as a town meeting member, and many of you are town meeting members, we rely upon the Warrant Committee to make recommendations that are in the best interest in the town and that are not influenced by political pressure. And that's very important. And when I, when I saw that the school budget presentations a couple of weeks ago were including a slide of next steps that had a call to action, encouraging people to, parents mainly, to call the Board of Selectmen, tell the Board of Selectmen to get on board with supporting an override. I said, gee, we've been on board supporting an override since last year. 
We were pretty vocal about it last fall. Milton Times reported on our meeting several times on the front page. I think everybody knows where the Board of Selectmen stands. It's been eight years since we've had an operating override, and we agree that we need an operating override this year. We needed one last year. We found some ways to avoid it, but we definitely need one this year. There was a slide that said, school parents should come lobby the Warren Committee. Ask the Warren Committee not to cut the school budget by X number of dollars. I, I spoke with the chair of the school committee. He and I served on this committee together. And I said, you know, I'm really concerned about that. Because when you and I served on the Warren Committee, the elected boards tried their best to protect us from political influence. The school committee, the board of selectmen, never encouraged people to come lobby the Warren Committee. The Warren Committee's job, we were the, those, they were the elected boards who were there to take the political comments. So were the town meeting members. But the Warren Committee has to be perceived as independent and fair and not based not basing their decisions on a room full of anyone, whether it's public safety personnel or school teachers or library workers or cemetery workers. It has to be what's your best judgment to bring forward to town meeting so that town meeting maintains its credibility in the work of the Warren Committee. Again, there's a reason that the Warren Committee typically carries the day at town meeting. It's, it's not common for a recommendation of the Warren Committee to go down at town meeting. That happens if you get a substantial block of town meeting members who might be opposed, or if there's a perception that there's a lot of unanswered questions and maybe something wasn't properly vetted. But the Warren Committee needs to be independent and free from political pressure. And I was not expecting, I'll be very honest, I was not expecting to walk into this room tonight seeing a lot of our dedicated public safety personnel. I know a lot of them. They're here tonight because, as I understand it from talking with people in the hall, the communications to the parents to come lobby for the school budget brought them out to lobby for the public safety budgets. That shouldn't happen. We are all in this together. We need to turn our attention very quickly to the contingent budget. You have to balance the non-contingent budget. I said to your chair in a conversation today that I think it was helpful in years past when the Warren Committee had the all-day Saturday meeting, and we balanced in an override year, we did the non-contingent and the contingent budget together. And all the department heads were in the room. We started at 8.30 in the morning, and we went probably till mid-afternoon, and there were a few breaks in between, and there was a chance for department heads to give some input if it looked like a, a cut was really going to impact them too much, or if there was a question to be answered. I think going forward, and I know that the Warren Committee moved away from that a few years ago before most of you were on the Warren Committee. I think that's something we need to consider going back to because it the format here, just focusing one night on the non-contingent and another night on the contingent, may not be as helpful as considering them both together. And I understand why we got to that point. So I'm asking you to focus as much as possible on the information that's before you, your own due diligence, and what's in the best interest of the town when you make your recommendations. On the topic of free cash, I know the town administrator and the town accountant, and many of you have seen and, and probably said a lot of this yourself before, it's one-time funds. There's no guarantee that free cash will be recurring at all, let alone in the same dollar amount. And I want to give you a couple of examples of that. In 2005, we had free cash in the amount of a million dollars. In 2006, we had free cash of $423,000. 2007, we had negative free cash of 140000 Just two years later, in 2009, again, we had negative free cash of $400,000. It can vary and fluctuate very widely, and that's why we can't rely upon it to be recurring. The Department of Revenue says that free cash should not be used on operating budgets. In 2007, a former Milton Board of Selectmen adopted some financial policies, and one of them was a free cash policy. It, it referred to one-time funds, meaning stabilization and free cash. And we're in the process of looking at those and seeing whether we might want to revise them. The Board of Selectmen at the time set that policy. I was on the Warren Committee. We were not a policy-making board, so we didn't set those create, formulate those policies, but we had input into them. The Selectmen sent them to us. They asked us for input. We discussed them. We weighed in. A lot of the elected boards gave comments to the the then Board of Selectmen, and those financial policies have been in place, and they're consistent on free cash with what the Department of Revenue says. Now, lastly, I want to talk about, the imp in terms of free cash, on the impact on the bond rating. The town is going to be in the capital markets for some time to come. We've got fire stations, we've got DPW yard, we've got a lot of capital needs every year. 
that come to town meeting. The town's management, you know, the Warren Committee members are not on those calls with Standard & Poor's. It's the town administrator, the town accountant, one of the members of the Board of Selectmen, usually Tom Hurley the last few years, who's taken that role for us. And management makes representations to the bond rating agencies as to where we are in the budget, what the Warren Committee and what <coughs> town meeting have done in prior years. Two years ago, we used some free cash for some operating expenses, and we did it after a lot of ex discussion, an extensive discussion among the school committee, the Warren Committee, and the Board of Selectmen. All three boards voted on it. Our board was not unanimous. Tom Hurley was very vocal in saying, it's not the right thing to do, it's one-time money, we shouldn't do this. So it was not unanimous. But there was, an ex there was an agreement among the boards to do that. And the only reason that the rest of us voted for it was because we said, we're going we, and we told the rating agencies, we have a plan to replace it. We're going to use some free cash this year, and we're expecting to go out for an operating override next year. It's been several years. Their needs are very great. We expect that the voters will view it favorably. We think there's a real need for it. We think the, we think the voters know that there's a real need for it after so many years. So we had a plan in place to replace them. Now, we've deferred the operating override for a year. It, that would have been last year. We deferred it for a year. But those representations were made to the bond rating agencies. And as I said, we're not going to be stepping away from the bond rating agencies anytime soon. We're, we're going to continue to be in the capital markets. Today, the town administrator had a call with Standard & Poor's on, her, on, her, on an upcoming issue. Just in the last two-year period, our free cash has decreased from $3 million to $1.3 million. So our board, like I think many of you, oppose the use of one-time monies, especially if we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars, for recurring operating expenses. And the reason is we can't replace it next year. We have no way of knowing if it will be there or not. And all we're doing is deferring for a year another tough decision. So we might, if, if the view is to avoid some layoffs this year because we're gonna use some free cash, all those layoffs are gonna happen the next year. And could, the layoffs could be even deeper if we wind up where we have less free cash um, and we don't get an override than, than what we had thought. There's no question that Milton has always prioritized public education. And in the last few years, the Board of Selectmen and the Warren Committee have been very supportive of using free cash for some one-time expenses in the school department. We had three or four years, of, I think three years, maybe four, of an advancement budget where we had about half a million dollars spent on one-time monies to close the achievement gap. We were very supportive of that. Last year, we used over $900,000 of free cash for full-day free kindergarten. And we were supportive of that. Tom Hurley was our chair at the time, and he advocated for that, recognizing that there was a real need for that. And we supported the school committee in their request. But it's important to note that that came at the expense of using those monies for other purposes, like roads, like improvements to the living quarters at the fire stations, like funding OPEB liabilities, like buying new equipment for different town departments, or putting further money away towards stabilization or towards retirement. So it's very important, and I am speaking for our board in letting you know that we are very opposed to using one-time monies for recurring operating expenses. And that is something that if a, if a budget premised on the use of free cash goes forward, that is something that I expect we would oppose at town meeting. And we want you to know that now so that we can be very transparent about where we would be on that. And I hope most of you or all of you would be in agreement that we should not take that action. Like the other speakers have said, we, we don't envy the position that you're in tonight. You're being asked to come up with a balanced budget that's fair and takes into account many important needs and priorities. When we met on February 1st, the town administrator and the town accountant presented their non-contingent budget proposal. That was their proposal. At the time, I asked you to give their budget the respect that it deserves because it's the product of the day-to-day -day management team in the town. There was an agreement between the school department and the other departments. It is an 80-20 split that the town administrator and his team proposed. <clears throat> I also said to you at that time, on behalf of our board, that we don't expect you to rubber stamp the town administrator's budget. We expect the Warren Committee to do what it's always done, to ask the hard questions, to do the due diligence, to form your own opinions. But we do expect that your opinions will be formed free from political pressure and not based on how many emails, how many calls, how many people have come to a microphone. The Warren Committee doesn't have citizen speak. 
the elected boards do, but the Warren Committee generally hasn't. And I think the Warren Committee should continue to not have citizens speak and to not have large groups of people looking to come in and lobby for political reasons. You're asked, you, you owe your duty to town meeting and you're asked to present to town meeting a budget that's based on your best judgment and what's in the best interest of the town of Milton. There are many important departments. Education is important, public safety is very important and I'm gonna defer to Mike Dennehy and to Amy Dexter and Chief Grant and Chief King and all of the other department heads who are here the chance to give you their $500,000 of combined impact statements. But please keep in mind that aside from the big departments, there are many needs in the town clerk's department, the veterans budget, the council on aging, all of the small departments have needs and all of the departments, especially the public safety departments over the last few years have had unfilled positions, have had important things that they would like to be able to do and that they should be able to do for, res for services to residents such as more patrols on the streets and better manning on the fire from the fire engines that they haven't been able to do because a lot of those positions have been vacant. And when Chief Grant comes up and says, as he did last week, that an, a reduction in overtime <coughs> means a reduction in services and it's basically the equivalent of a layoff, he's correct. It may not be a layoff per se, but it's less time that there's, we have firefighters on the engines and providing services to the town. So we recognize that the ball's in your court. We think it's a little bit premature for people to be presuming that the 80-20 split is going to town meeting. That was the starting point, and we know that you're going to take the ball now, and it's in your court, and you're going to fulfill your responsibility of doing what's in the best interest of the town. We ask you to do it, as, you, as the Warren Committee always has done, free from political pressure. So I thank you very much for listening. Thank you. I think Richard has a question for you. It's more of a question, but a con like um, to clarify, um, last four cycles that I've been on, um, the question of free cash, the one-time monies has come up, and I can't can't only speak for myself, but I think, as far as I hear from the group, they everybody feels the way you do. Um, but the last four cycles I've been on, every year somebody around the table asks, and we always get the answer: Why is there free cash? Where did it come from? And it helps us. Um, formulate other opinions. We might not be looking to use it, but I think in doing your due diligence, and, and I was one of the folks probably in the last meeting that talked about it, um, if you watched it, and from my point of view, it's you have to ask that question to do your due diligence to find out where did it come from, why is it there. Maybe you're not going to use it for operating expenses, but it, it, it does help you understand what's going on with the budget. Um, so I just wanted to you know, just so you knew, it wasn't, I, at least from no, my I, point I of understand. view, I wasn't looking to spend a few hundred thousand dollars of, of one-time money on operating expenses, but, and I hope we do get the answer, it would be nice to peel back where, where did it come from? And I think some of the comments around the room were, well, maybe the answer is quickly no, but was there something that happened that is operating money that went into that that would be recurring? That's usually a question that's been asked every year. Uh, a lot, usually it's no, but sometimes I think in the past there has been, well, this f flowed back in, but you know, you really shouldn't use it, and it's just part of the conversation. Sometimes there are departments that may have a vacancy for a period of a few weeks or a few mm -hmm. months. Um, you know, for the example that. of the police department, they, they have the people have to go through the academy before yeah. they can get on the street. So often, in, in, the, um, in the Selectman's budget, occasionally mm -hmm. over the past couple of years, we've had periods where we were hiring an assistant town administrator and the, and the position was vacant for a while. So, yeah. so unused salary gets turned, flows into free cash at the end of the year. It can yeah. be offset by, you know, if, if revenues on the mm -hmm. motor vehicle excise don't come in where we think they're going to come in or where permit fees come in a little bit lower. It, it, it's never, you can never say that just because a department turned back $20,000 that $20,000 goes right into free cash because it, it's all, it has to all be netted, and the, so there may be a decrease in revenue, and, and there are any number of reasons that can lead to Agreed, free crash varying. One of my concerns is, though, when you don't talk about it, then folks might be listening, or you hear people on the street saying, wow, oh, there's $2 million sitting there. Well, here's the reason why it's sitting there. And so if you actually go through it and explain to folks where it is, the question's not going to come up again. And, and we want to have free cash, right? We don't want to be in a situation where we have negative free cash. That That's... That's bad. That means we've we've um, we've done some things we shouldn't have done, or or we or we've had some estimates that were not right. So the D, as as the chairman explained, I, I did hear it at the last meeting. 
the DOR prefers that we do have some free cash at the end of every year and that we use it for purposes that are one time. And it's, it's, it's part of our unrestricted reserves. So it's, it's not a stabilization unless, fund unless we put it into a stabilization fund, which we can do. But it's, but it's, it's part of our overall reserves. And it's, it's looked upon favorably if we are generating some free cash. So it's, it's usually coming from a lot of different sources. And, and vacant positions in departments is one of the, was one of the big reasons that some departments might turn back some monies at the end of the year. Does anybody else have any other questions for? Chair Conlon. Yeah. <clears throat> so on the two subjects you spoke about, so do you support the 80-20 split? I said to you on February 1st that the Board of Selectmen supports what our town administrator okay. has put forward. The reason for that, and I, again, I think, I think Mike Denny and Amy Dexter should speak more to the details on that. The, the amount of the increase for the school department in the non-contingent budget was $2.8 million. The amount for the towns, the non-school departments was around uh, round number $700,000. That's a very hard gap to close. And the town administrator used one means of doing the split. I, I believe, I understand that they looked at all of the budgets, they tried to see where they could make some cuts, and they came out, what they came out to was a percentage of 80-20. Of That's one way of looking at it. There's a multitude of ways of coming up with a split. We don't believe that it's unreasonable. We think it's a reasonable way of doing it. It's it is going to give the school department an increase over FY17 dollars, a pretty substantial one. Um, but because of the amount of the rollover costs and the special education costs that they have, and, and we, as I said at the February 1st meeting, you know, we we recognize the position that they're in. They have some unfunded mandates that are that are upon them. Their town side has some of that too in different departments. It's a tough choice. It's one means. It, it's the starting point for this committee, but your committee's job is to take the ball from there. This is the first year we're going through this with the town administrator presenting a budget. We haven't done that before. It's new under the legislation, it's, it's, and it's going to be a learning experience for all of us as we go through this process. But that was early February. We're now at the end of February, and that's, it should inform your decision making, and it's one way of looking at it. We don't expect you to necessarily say, okay, we don't have any more work to do. You, you do. Your, your responsibility and your fiduciary duty is to town meeting to give them your best judgment. So you may decide, well, in, in doing our own due diligence, we've got additional areas where we think cuts can be made or we think that, that um, over time we, the state may turn, may turn out that there's an increase in local aid and we get some additional revenues that come in and we have to apportion that. As you go through your process, you may come out in a different place. It might be close to what the town administrator suggested. It might not be. Where is... You know, we're going to respect the work that you put forward because we know the due diligence you're putting in, and we're just going to hope that your your work is going to be consistent with what Warren committees have done in the past, and let's try to be fair to everybody and recognize the public safety needs as well as the education needs and the needs of all the other smaller departments that so, don't fit into either category. Totally different subject, much more tactical. So I'm the free cash guy, so I want to use free cash. So this so. Lee Michael happened to send this to me. This is from the Department of Revenue, Division of Local Services. As a non-recurring revenue source, free cash should be restricted to paying one-time expenditures, funding capital projects, or replacing, replacing other reserves. When a community incorporates free cash in, uh, into revenue source projections for next year's operational expenses, it is prudent to place a percentage restriction on the total free cash to be used. So that's, that doesn't sound, unless I'm missed, understanding that it doesn't sound to me like you know no no never it's like be prudent and it should be at some small percentage unless I'm reading that wrong am I reading that wrong I think at the top I, of the page it yeah. does say they discourage yeah. the they discourage it. it but it's it's uh, not written so um, it's not a sound practice to do that it's and, not and a sound it, and practice. it's against the town's financial policies okay. that were put in place by the chief policy making board of the town and you know there was a time many years ago when the town did use our free cash for operating expenses, and there was a concerted effort to move away from that over the course of the last 15 years. Everyone recognized that it wasn't what we should be doing, and we weren't, we weren't funding some needed capital items because of it, and we were just patching budgets here and there. I so totally it, agree, it was, everyone recognized that it was wrong. And I, I think, I, I haven't read what you have in front of you, the, the whole document recently, but the DOR does very much frown on using it for operating expenses because it's, it's just not going to be there next year. There's no guarantee of it. Totally understand. But when people say the DOR won't let you, it doesn't say that. So it's, I think it's better to say it's a bad idea, it's bad practice. It's definitely it's a easy, bad idea and bad uh, practice. Because it, it's not, <laughs> yeah. well, the DOR won't let you do that. Well, it actually doesn't say <clears throat> you can't do that. It's, 
says you should. It's very you frowned upon, and the bond, bond rating agencies frowned upon it also, and especially when they've been told what our plan was two years ago. Um, you know, that's that's something that town management is constantly answering to them on. And fortunately for the Warren community members, you don't you don't have to be on those calls, but the you know the, the management team does have to be on those calls, and it's it's. Um, when they're representing one thing, it, we have to be mindful of that, and we want to ask all the elected boards and the Warren Committee to really stay with the same plan because it's 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 not going to help us going forward with uh, with our with our debt service costs if we wind up with a different rating because suddenly we're looking like we're not acting as financially responsible as we once did. That's that's the risk we run. Quick question, Maggie. You, you made a, um, I mean, I don't know about the other members, but I wasn't on this board last year about last year how I think it was 900,000 was used for the school committee for free cash and then maybe 500 for the school in prior in about three prior years so last year you said it was for full <clears throat> full kindergarten full isn't that an operating expense or what happened that you it had is. to the, use the, the free schools cash are not getting a reimbursement for that from the state so they needed a one time they needed a one time payment so it was considered one time but it was a substantial amount of free cash and my point to that was that you know we've prioritized some use of one time monies for school one time needs we haven't done that for roads and for other items and as much as we'd like to in recent years and we're really hoping that that some of those other needs in the non school budgets will be given serious consideration for for one. Well, how do you make that decision that you're going to give it to the, say that as opposed to roads or some other department when you have well, the free it, cash? It, the, whenever the chair has it on the uh, on the schedule, the town administrator will come in with his proposal, and and you'll all be voting on that at some point. And the capital planning improvement oh, committee okay. will submit a long list of requests that we can't possibly meet, and we'll have to prioritize <laughs> them. Okay. Oh. We need uh, to move on quickly, but yes, yes you yeah. Have, you have let me let me allay your 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 um, your um, fears. Um, we are we have we are all prepared to we are all prepared to do the right thing on this board. Let me assure you. Um, none of us, there's no one on this board that thinks there's any fat in the budget. There's no one on this board that, that does not think that everyone is doing their job regardless of, of how their budget comes out. This, this, they, are, they, are, they always go above, always. I've been on this for three or four years, and it's, it's, very, it's like every other board I've been on. They always go the extra mile. And so when we look at these budgets, to, to have any idea that you're not going to, in full accord, give them the full measure of what they need. We wouldn't do that because that would be wasting everybody's time here. And we all know what wasting time is about. And no one here can do that. No one can afford to do that. So let me assure you that um, there is no political, there is no political opportun opportunities here that I've heard about. And it's certainly, it's, it is, that is not what we do. That's good to know, Jan. What I was referring to was the, the campaign to, to get a lot of people here, and then yeah. the, the response to it, which was to bring out other departments. And it's unfortunate that that happened, but um, but we glad you made those comments. Thank you. Thanks, Katie. Thank Appreciate you very much. Thank Are you, you sticking around for a while? Yes, yes, okay. we'll be here for tonight. Great. Michael and Amy, do you want to join us at the table? Do you want to bring a chair over, too? Is Phil Matthews here somewhere by any chance? Okay. Did you text him? Mm -hmm. He wasn't at home. Okay, all right. So we're going to have um, Michael and Amy go through the larger range of potential cuts on the town side departments. And I assume you're going to have a couple of department heads come up and, and give some testimony. I do see some folks leaving. Um, I, I just want to say that if you did sit through one of the school committee presentations on their budget, I think it would be great if you could, at a time at your convenience, watch this on Milton Access TV to see what the corresponding impacts are on the rest of the town, because every department is suffering. And that, that message may not get out if you only go to one of the many budget presentations we hear. But this should be a good summary, so I'd encourage folks to, to tune in if, if you're going to leave. So, Michael, thanks. Great. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, members of the committee. Um, thanks for having uh, Town Account and Amy Dexter, myself, back here tonight. Um, 
We were here last Wednesday. Unfortunately, we, we ran the $300,000 numbers for you, um, which was which was the 20% uh, methodology that the town accountant, myself, and, and my predecessor, Emory Fagan, had worked through uh, diligently since uh, we received the budgets, uh, both contingent and non-contingent, um, in, in early December. Um, so what we did was, after sitting uh, with the group on Wednesday, your group, we uh, met with the town, uh, the larger town departments. Uh, many people have spoken about some of the smaller departments not being able to absorb um, the $300,000 cut or a percentage thereof. Um, so it would be uh, not prudent to, uh, to force them into this uh, $525,000 cut. Um, so we did sit with the larger department heads, uh, Joe Lynch from Public Works, uh, John King, Chief of Police, Jack Grant, uh, Chief of Fire, uh, Will Adamchek, couldn't be there, but he had already prepared an a, a impact statement and, and a cut therefore. So um, basically what we did is we walked through, uh, Dave Perdios from Parks was there, and Trace Desmond from Cemeteries is there. So basically we walked through, and, and the town accountant can give you our methodology on how we took that additional $225,000 um, and cut it. Um, uh, again, we're all talking about cuts. It, it, it's a we, right? We have a meeting tomorrow at 10 o'clock. Uh, Superintendent Gormley, Assistant Superintendent Glenn Pavlicek, and a multitude of the people I mentioned earlier on the town side to go over our contingent priorities um, to, so that we continue to row in the same direction uh, with, the, with the override budget. Uh, we will present that to Board of Selectmen tomorrow night uh, and then be back here Wednesday night to talk about uh, the contingent priorities. So it, it, is, it is prevalent. It's at the top of our agenda, um, and it's something that the town accountant and I uh, are working through currently. Um, Amy, do you want to just go through quickly sure. how, how we came up with these cuts? And I think it would be more prudent, Chair, if, if we bring, if you have any questions about how we divvied up the $225,000, um, ask us some questions and maybe defer to the department heads for, for impact statements. Okay. Okay. Um, first of all, I'm going to go to page three of the presentation just to give a little summary for the people that didn't see last week. Um, the town departments exclusive of the school department submitted non-contingent budget requests for FY 2018, totaling $25,094,517. That was excluding 93,500 in one-time non-recurring items. This non-contingent budget request represents an increase of $715,320 above the FY 17 funding or 2.93% increase. Of the 715,000 above FY17, 524,000 re relates to contractual salary and wage obligations to the town side employees. The remaining balance of just not 190,000 relates to other contra contractual obligations on the town departments for contracts that have been entered, signed, that the town is obligated to honor. There are no new positions included in the town non-contingent budget requests. And what is not in the non-contingent budget requests is 10.5 full-time equivalent positions that have been approved by the personnel board, meaning they have acknowledged that there's a need on the town department for these positions, but they have not been funded in the non-contingent budget in prior years. A lot of these have been there for several years and they haven't been funded due to budgetary constraints. When the town submitted the non-contingent request, these were not <coughs> included because those were the instructions that were given. Of those 10.5 full-time equivalents, there's um, a code, office, code officer, code enforcement officer and inspectional service. There's a fire lieutenant, two police officers, an outreach coordinator in the Council on Aging, 2.5 employees in the library, a laborer in the Parks Department, and two laborers in the Consolidated Facilities Department. The town was previously requested to summarize an impact of 300,000, which represented the 80-20% split that people have been talking about. This presentation of a $525,000 cut to the town side represents the 35%, 65% split. If the town were to absorb a $525,000 cut, they would only be receiving approximately $190,000 above FY17 
funding, which I believe comes out to less than 1%, maybe 0.77. Contractual wage obligations were about 2%. So we're not even, we would not even be receiving the wage adjustments that we're contractually obligated to pay. When trying to spread the 525,000, as Michael and Ms. Conlin. Um, Just ask them to go back to slide two. Yeah, oh, thank I'm you. sorry, yes. Uh, Ms. Conlin and uh, Mr. Dennehy mentioned before, the town's very lean. Um, we did not feel that a lot of the smaller departments could absorb any of the cut. If you look, I did calculate just on a percentage of the total on the town wide departments what their cut would be. A lot of them just can't possibly absorb any of the cut because there's nowhere to cut. They have minimal general expenses and um, very lean staff. So what we had to do in order to try to absorb that full amount on the town side was unfortunately had to spread much of it to the larger departments, public safety, um, DPW, library, cemetery, parks. So in order to do that, we sat numerous times with the department heads um, mainly the major ones, and we just, we just hashed out, we talked about what are we going to do, and we just really tried to spread it as fairly and as evenly as possible. If you look at the summary on the right side, this 525000 represents about a 2%, um, a little over 2% cut to these departments. Um, those departments under the Board of Selectmen would be getting approximately a 2.10% decrease and then the other boards under separate boards and committees are in the range from um, 1 percent to 2.25. So the major departments taking the majority of the cut are fire department $109,000, consolidated facilities $20,000, inspectional services $12,500, library $30,280, Police, 142,832. DPW departments combined is approximately 141,537. Cemetery, 18,434. And Parks and Rec, 11,203. The balance, um, a little bit here and there amongst some of the other remaining departments. Just, just to elaborate on how tough it was and how far we dig how far we had to dig. If you look at the Board of Health number, that 2,733 number, that's a nurse um, which was budgeted at 11.9 hours. We reduced it to 10. I mean, it's just that. And, and that hasn't actually been just, we haven't had an opportunity to talk to the Board of Health about right. that, but that's how desperate we were getting. We're looking at cutting back because the position is currently vacant, it's approved by the personnel board. They need someone. They desperately need somebody. They need somebody, I think it's approved at 16 hours, trying to save whatever we can. We're trying to cut wherever we can to save what we can in public save, safety, to save what we can in DPW, to save what we can in, in cemetery, parks, library. It, it's, I think we all agree that any measure of cuts on the town side, school side, combined are going to hurt. I don't think there's a single person in this room that would deny that fact, including Michael and I. And when we were pulling this together, trying to be as fair as possible, between the two of us, we have nine children in the Milton Public School System, soon to be nine when your little one goes in. We have a lot at stake here, too. We are just trying to be what, you know, to, to spread it as fairly as possible. And so if you look quickly at, at the, th the difference between the 300 and the 525, it, it spread pretty evenly, that 225,000, if you take a look at the percentage from the 300,000. Uh, we took a bigger chunk out uh, of Public Works in the first 300. Um, it leveled off a bit in, in, in the second 225, uh, but $141,000 cut is $141,000 cut. So um, obviously, uh, 4% of a cut to any, any budget is, is detrimental. But um, this was the process and methodology we used. Um, again, uh, are we hoping that some of the state and local aid 
and what we hear from House One and Senate come through and, and, and they sharpen their pencil and give us a couple more? Yes, but as you, have, you've heard testimony from people before, it's not going to be $1.579 million. It's, it's not going to bail us out. So um, th this is where we stand today. Uh, it's been a lot of work. I, I appreciate all the work from all, all the department heads. Uh, we've met with the schools several times. Um, I think uh, Jack Grant and John King and sick of looking at us. It's, um, it's, it's, a, it's a very, very thorough process that got us to here. It's, it's not a great story, but uh, as you can see, we, we tried to divide the cuts on the town side as evenly as possible. Um, but, but I think uh, if you want to hear from the impact statements from the department heads themselves, it would, sure. it, it, in case anyone has any questions or something. So. Yeah, if we're going to move on to the next slide, which is fire, I would suggest that Jackie pull a chair up to the table and join. Don't leave Amy. And we, we, just as <clears throat> she's getting ready, Amy, can I ask you about you excise taxes? Yes. You know how you estimate what they're going to be? Yes. I know the first batch is already out. Do you have a sense from that first batch whether you were conservative or where that falls right now? So the difficulty with motor vehicle excise tax right. is, is it's very inconsistent. It fluctuates. The, um, what It's actually billed out by the tax collector, not the town accountant. Mm -hmm. um, so he would be a better person to ask, okay. but it's my understanding that the first, what they refer to as the first commitment yeah. um, went out, and it was very similar to the first commitment <clears throat> of last year, but that's not necessarily an indicator that we're going to collect the same amount. Yeah. Okay. Um, and how many batches or how many go out? A year? I believe well, there was seven last year. Seven. And the first batch was literally, there was one more build this year than last year. I spoke with the town treasurer last week just to identify that question. Um, in the first round of, of contingent talks with everyone, uh, it came up and, and are we being too conservative with it? And, and I appreciate uh, Amy's diligence with that because it came out pretty much with uh, almost exactly where the first first okay. phase was last year. But the, uh, I believe there are seven. Chuck, um, what uh, you may not have this, but I, th I think you do. What would the cut be if uh, if the contractual raise if everything was funded just to the dollar? Just five hundred twenty-four. If we just funded the the wage increase, yes. the two percent. Which only I, only indicates the um, the salary increase in some of the departments. There's other incentives that that doesn't even cover. But that would be about it. Would be five hundred and twenty-five thousand of the seventeen funded, which would be a set a two hundred and ten thousand dollar two hundred thousand cut to fully fund. I believe there are about eight one point nine on the school side. Like one eight seven five. Yeah, that's right. Okay, they advanced us to the fire department slide. Just a question. Right. Yes, sir. Well, maybe it'll be answered in this, but will you be talking about specifically the loss of those positions that are facing the fire budget? Fire budget? Um, Chief Grant will yeah. discuss these. Oh. Chief Grant. First of all, uh, thanks for allowing me to sit here again. I've, uh, I've already taken up too much of your time, and I, and I appreciate how much time that this committee puts in. Um, something I want to throw out there, just to clarify. This is my eighth or ninth budget cycle sitting at this table. And in that period of time, I've never, ever come to you and ask you for what we want as a fire department. We had this discussion the other night a little bit. I'm 25 people away from what I want on the fire department. I'm, I took a, let me jump out of order a little bit. Mike, you asked, oh, Lee Michael, I'm sorry. You, um, you asked the other night what the real number for our department is. And it's a conversation that Anne-Marie Fagan and I have had offline a couple of times. The number that we, that I would view acceptable is 64. And what 64 people on the department gives us is a 13-man minimum and allows us to create a three-man ladder company. That there is going to give us a much safer fire ground for the firefighters and a much safer public citizen safety. So I want to start there. Like I say, I have never come 
with that before you and ask for what we want. We're so far away from that, it's, it's not even a blip on the horizon. We're asking you to keep us from drowning. That's what we're asking for. We've absorbed <coughs> cuts, and, and I, I wasn't sitting at the tables when this happened, but I'm gonna say we absorbed unfair cuts from the late 70s to the early 90s that put us to where we are right now. And that's got an, us in a position where I'm sitting here before you to tell you we can't take any more. Uh, there's been a number of years that we've survived here with a level playing field, and that wasn't always the case. Um, <coughs> I've sat before boards of selectmen before, and this, this is where part of this comes from. And, and I've made the statement to them, much like I just said, you know, where I would like to be as a department. And even that's not where we should be. But I've made the statement to them over there, and this has been different boards. I've never brought it here. Uh, if you leave us alone at 56, we are reasonably getting the job done. But let me, let me jump to my notes here at this point in time. And, and some of this is going to sound like a broken record, and I apologize for that. <coughs> but almost every time I sit before you, I state that we're operating at ground zero. Conducting operations in these conditions puts our firefighters into dangerous situations. In my time as chief, we've had several close calls. I've had three firefighters over this time that have run out of ear while they were operating the build in the building. In one of those cases, one of the firefighters stepped out the living room window because he didn't have enough air to get to the front door. As he came out the window, he leaned on the railing <coughs> of the front porch, catch his breath. Railing on the front porch gives way. He rolls into the, uh, to the driveway. Another case, we had a gentleman in the basement, <coughs> fire in the basement. They couldn't find the fire. Basement fire, there's no ventilation. There's no visibility. So he loses his way. Thankfully, in these situations, it was brief periods of problems, and they were able to extricate themselves without harm. We have another case that we have two firefighters that got knocked to the floor in a flashover. In this condition here, thankfully, they were sitting at the doorway into the room that was on fire. Had they been six feet further into that room that was the fire room, I'd be sitting here telling you about their funeral. This is where we're at. We're, we're operating very close to the line here. It's a fine line, and it's a tough place to be. And you're standing out front hoping your guys are going to get out OK. And that's what we're dealing with. And that's what I have to try to get across to you. You know, I've stated before <coughs> that, and this is just last week, so again, I'm being repetitive. We were up to 70 firefighters at one point in time, and understaffed at that. Again, we're 56 now. I brought up the 64. I don't have a prayer of having that conversation this time. I throw that out there to let you know how far away from it we are. Over the last three or four years, I've come before here, and I've sat in the chair, and my message has been the same, that we're coming here. We're not surviving. Three years before that, my message was, it's out there on the horizon. We're losing ground quick. This is the year that it, that it, that it all comes together. And just one final thing that I, that I want to try to get you to understand where we're at. I've got something I want you to listen to. It's not rap music. <laughs> I'm going to have to do it this way. 
We could hear that. Jack, do you want to set up for folks what we're going to listen to? Uh, I'd like to come back to that after I play it, if you... Okay. That pretty much gives you the message. There's more there. What you're listening to there is a fire department similar to ours. You're listening to a department that's already understaffed, and in this situation, they have a company out of service because they don't have funding for it. That's what we're heading for. That's what I'm trying to get across to you. That's where the Milton Fire Department is. That's why we can't take the cuts that we have. That's why these guys are in this room with me tonight. Thank you. Jack, do you want to hang out for a minute in case somebody has a question? Does anybody have a question? I, one simple, well, one yep. anyway. With regard to brownouts, can you just address at the larger end of this spectrum, what would the impact on your operations be if you absorb the, yep. the um, cut that we're talking um, about? You know what, I, I meant to bring that up right at the start, so I apologize for that. On the lower end, real quick, we're not gonna get through the air on the lower cut, so uh, I'm a big advocate for you to support the 80-20 split. At that level, I'm gonna see brownouts toward the end of the year. At the heavier cut, what's going to happen is we're going to lay off two people and we're going to start brownouts July 1st. We'll be browned out more often than we're in service. 
that's that's where we'll be at. And the brownout means one of our three stations will be closed. Yeah, in this case, the way we've handled it in the past and the way I foresee handling it at this point in time won't be a full station closure because what I'll do is close this engine behind us here. That way the other two outside engines can come to the middle and we have some sort of balance. Okay. But it's the same effect as it, it's a full closed engine company. Okay. Qu yeah, Richard. Uh, just to cl clear, can you clarify, was that with the 57 or the 109? That's the... Or full. With the 57, we'll see brownouts toward the end of the fiscal year. Uh, my guess, and this could be flexible depending on how healthy we are that year, because that's always a question. It will be anywhere from, you know, April to the end of the year. But is the 109 guess. brings you to 50. 109 is we're going to start July 1st. That's the 50. That's the, the cut that's, too. Yeah, yeah. By healthy, and, he means if, if folks get injured and he has yeah. to go to the right, right. reserve fund right. or his overtime. Yeah, and, and, and he'll run out of money. You know, one of the re one of the things that, you know, and we've tried to define that 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 overtime is, you know, manpower supplement. Um, you know, the reason we'll have to start at July 1st is that we're still going to have to keep our eye on that overtime through the course of the year so that we don't get to the point come April or May that, you know, we've spent it at too, far, too great a rate and now say we have, you know, six or seven people out on one tour for whatever reason. You know, then we have to operate with what we have come through the door and, you know, we may be down two companies. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's... <clears throat> It's a difficult, very difficult situation. Maggie? So, Chief, correct me if I'm wrong, but when we met for the subcommittee, didn't you say that you're already below the required minimum on the ladder trucks as it is? Yeah, the we're, safety? we're not recognized. It, uh, under, <clears throat> under the NFPA's de definitions, a fully staffed engine, or uh, actually NFPA 1710 requires four people on all apparatus. Fully staffed is actually five people on the apparatus. Below three, they don't recognize it as a company at all, and we're running our ladder truck with one. So by laying off a couple of more people, as you just said, you're really putting the safety of all of your men in jeopardy. Well, the men and the people in the town. That's true. Um, you know, there's, there's many times that we have all three engines out and tied up. Um, you know, there's a handful of times during the year that you even have the ladder truck out on different runs. Um, we had a fire about a year ago uh, over on Hudson Street, and we had another, phone, uh, another call come in for a, a kitchen fire that was in that area. Uh, I actually sent one of our guys over there to investigate it in a pickup truck because, you know, our mutual aid coverage from Boston wasn't in town yet. Uh, and there, you know, there was a fire there, and thankfully it was, you know, confined to the to the stove, uh, and you know, caused some smoke damage. But these are the kind of things that we're dealing with. You know, I, I'm not kidding when I, I say that if, if you guys cut us to the point where we close that engine company, there's going to be times we cannot provide public safety to this town. Richard, uh, so uh, just a quick question. Um, so under the 80-20 scenario, if the 57,000 cut, if you get to the point at the end of the year of a brownout, is, is it possible to come back for a reverse re, um, reserve fund transfer at that point? It's possible, but odds are there may not be anything. Be any money, right? You can't rely on a situation like that. that with, with the cuts that everybody's looking at, yeah, we're not, we're not banking I'm on just, it I just didn't year. know if it was actually possible. It's possible. But, oh, I, I, I'll come and ask. <laughs> yeah, uh, he's been denied in the past, uh, or not fully. Well, no, it never got there. We, there was talk one year that there wasn't going to be enough to fulfill the re request, um, but as it turned out, somebody that had been out was right on the bubble of coming back, and one was, and it might have even been two people. So we, we dodged the bullet in that case, but we did get to the point where you guys were going <laughs> to shut me down. And that, that was either the last year or the year before. I don't recall which, which year it was. Yes, Steve. Chief, have you had, I know not in the recent past, because I don't remember if I in the more distant past, times when there have been brownouts. And, and at, for those times, do you have data on what that's done to negatively impact response? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, and, and I don't have a complete set of data, but I can relate two instances to you. Um, 
There was only one time where we went through uh, brownouts, and I think it was a two-year period. It was the end of Chief Larson's career, um, so the two years prior to me coming into the office. Um, and we had one situation where there was a fire down off of Center Street, one of the side streets in the Milton Academy area. Um, that did not affect us because it happened to be a day that all companies were in service. Uh, there was another day, though, that we had a fire come in that was down off of Hillside Street somewhere. Um, new construction, so there was, you know, it was unfurnished at this point in time. This engine, first new engine to that scene, was out of service. The ladder truck arrived there uh, and, to be perfectly honest, made a tremendous call and sat in the street and watched the fire, um, you know, which I'm sure has you guys all scratching your head as to how that was a tremendous call. But, you know, last time that we were here, we kind of talked about, you know, ventilation and hose lines and all that. And well, obviously, there's more to, uh, to it than what I'm throwing at you guys. But to be effective with that kind of stuff, the two of them have to be coordinated. So if the ladder company without water went in and opened the door to that building, they're feeding it. You know, they're giving it all the oxygen it wants, and, you know, they're basically they're going to burn the building down. So they made a good call, uh, and, you know, they saved the building from being rebuilt from ground up. But in the meantime, with all the smoke that was generated during that period of time, that new home had to be gutted and redone from the inside. So considerable, considerable damage. I, I guess I wasn't looking for examples as much as you know, I know you guys log when you get the call and when you get there. So that you know, what does it what does it do? Does it go from three minutes to five minutes by having the station offline? Uh, I'd have to look at that, but you know, to cloud the issue on you, to complicate your question, you know, now we're talking about one less engine <coughs> in service to begin with. So that's going to cause the two outside engines to be running on coverage for the missing district. So we don't know where they're going to be coming from. Um, so it's safe, very safe to say that you're adding anywhere from two minutes to four plus minutes to a call. One thing that I haven't heard you mention here tonight that, that you mentioned to me when you played that recording for me the first time mm -hmm. is that one, another disadvantage of having the center station shut down is then if you have one of the stations on the edge respond to something towards the middle of town and then you get a call on the edge of town, now you how go, long is it going to take for yeah. somebody to respond to that side yeah. of town now? That's that's a great point because now you're... What was your point? You, oh, you've got... <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for remembering it. <laughs> Thanks for paying attention. Sure. And then um, the other thing on that recording is that you didn't tell folks where it was. It was a town in Massachusetts. Oh, right. Thank and you it very was, much. It yeah. was made in January of this year. It was December or January of this year. It was Holyoke, and there was three fatalities in that fire. So, like I say, and I think the point that you made to me when you played it the first time was how quickly it went from an initial call. The, I, I assume many and, of these people had not heard that, and that kind of recording. Before, I'm sure but. there's a lot in there that you didn't understand, but you know, there's there's a lot of what we do currently on steroids there is, you know, you, you heard the chief and that the guy that you heard was me, not me, but my position out there. And I stand in front of the building. <clears throat> I shouldn't sound out of breath like that. I should sound like I'm sounding to you right now. So that's the kind of strain this guy was under in this instance. Um, what you heard him doing there was drop what you're doing. I don't care what you're doing. Come up here and do this. Com, you know, complete scramble to do the best they could. So, you know, like I say, a, a department very similar to ours in that their staffing's below what it should be to begin with and, you know, then winds up with another engine down and we don't want to be that town. I'm going to suggest at this point we take a five minute recess and have Chief King swap with Chief Grant and then we'll come back and we'll continue on. Budgets? You won't see me back this year, I promise. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Phil, do you want to um, join us at the table as well? <laughs> Squeeze in somewhere. <laughs>
Welcome back, everybody. Thank you for the brief break. Um, we're joined at the table now by uh, Chief King, and we're going to move on in the presentation to the cuts affecting uh, the suggested cuts that would affect the police department. Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone. Good to see everyone again. Um, basically, uh, before we even talked about any potential cuts, uh, you know, I mentioned when I was here before that we're authorized for 56 officers, but we only have 53 currently funded. So we're already operating at an equivalent of having three layoffs. Whether you call them layoffs, vacancies, or unfunded positions is somewhat irrelevant. The impact's all the same. We have three less officers than authorized. If on top of that we're forced to make another $142,832 cut, it would be taken from the salary and wages line item. To do so, we're forced to either lay off officers or to cut overtime. We would choose to reduce overtime before laying off only because we could not handle drop in a total of four to five positions below authorization. That would be the current three plus an additional layoffs to equalize the cut. The current overtime amount is $380,340. So a $142,832 reduction would reduce our total overtime by 37.55%. A cut of this magnitude will result in significant reduction of personnel on the street. Overtime is not a luxury. Some people seem to like have a perception that it is, but it really isn't. It's used to backfill vacant positions as well as handle emergency situations and investigations. Cutting overtime is the equivalent of laying off personnel because it still results in a reduction of actual officers on the street. Just some examples of what we would have to implement to uh, accommodate for those cuts. You know, basically, in terms of police in my whole career, with the town's broken up into six sectors. Uh, we're already operating below the minimum of six. We currently go to five due to the shortage of the three current officers. With this cut to overtime, we basically wouldn't be able to backfill overtime when people are out. So we would reduce that to four cruises on the street, which essentially is four cruises covering the six sectors scattered around town. Um, they know, may not sound drastic, but you're operating at two-thirds of the uh, normal staff and, and you know a lot of these calls some calls are simultaneous calls some calls require more than one officer you know you have a domestic call you have a car accident you know one officer might be talking to a person the other officer is directing traffic so quickly four officers could fall to two um, the reality is it's going to delay a response to calls non-emergency calls would uh, be delayed and there'd be no discretionary action taken. Uh, you, there'd be no time for traffic enforcement. There would be no targeted directed assignments. Those are used if people are complaining about, you know, kids drinking in the quarries. We, we wouldn't be able to send officers to, you know, patrol that area proactively. We'd certainly respond to any call for service, but there would be a delay. Um, same when, you know, we have areas where houses might get broken into, cars get broken into, common theft crimes in Milton. We usually try and target those with directed patrols. We wouldn't be able to do that if our man is down to four officers. Uh, a secondary aspect is we would cut overtime to all special events. That, that really ranges from things like the National Night Out, road races, parades, and any similar event. Uh, it also, unfortunately, would really impact some of the community stuff we're doing. You know, we attend the Milton Substance Abuse Prevention Coalition. I'm on that board, and I would still be there, but I wouldn't be able to send the school resource officers. Uh, same with the Traffic Commission. We moved those meetings to nights to accommodate you know, the residents, and we probably have to move it back to days. I pay a lieutenant who oversees all traffic. I pay a secretary. They both get overtime to go to those meetings. Um, and we would basically implement uh, role and reassignments of specialty officers. Uh, you know, we have detectives, currently the lowest number we've ever had. We have school resource officers. Uh, those are full-time positions, and we have part-time people who handle such things as elderly affairs, domestic violence, stuff like that. Uh, we cover crossing guards every time a crossing guard is out. And if you're reducing your staff from, from six sectors down to four, we're not going to do any of those things. Uh, they would have to be reassigned back to patrol to prevent the overtime. So it's basically an almost 40% cut of overtime. It's drastic. You know, I realize, you know, tough job and you guys have to do what you have to do. I respect that. But that would be the impact on the police department. Thank you. Yes, Richard. Uh, just to clarify, I, I'm sorry you said it already, but same as I asked the fire, the going from 85000 to 142000 which one is the, is it cuts on 85,000 uh, of police officers, or is it just cuts on the increased to 142? Uh, on 85,000 or the 142, both of them would be cut from the overtime line item, so either one would impact all the same things. The only difference is, you know, on the 85, it's about 22.35% of the time. 
on the higher number, it's about 37.55 percent. So, you know, you can basically say that's how often we would be dropping the man, you know, 22 percent of the time versus 37 percent of the time. Okay. Other questions? For yes, Maggie. So, um, you know how you, your wish list was for two extra offices when we had met. One was, of course, because uh, the substance abuse, I think you said, is the number one leading cause of death here in Milton, other than normal, natural. you know, natural causes. And then the other issue was regarding all of the traffic issues that we have, because that's a big deal here with the cut-throughs and everything. Correct. So not only will you not be getting anything like that, but you're also going to be taking away two extra offices. Is that right? It's essentially, you know, I'm forced to either cut two officers or to cut the overtime. I chose to cut it from the overtime so that I can pick and choose as opposed to just cutting the two officers. Uh, either way, it's the same. It's going to reduce the number of officers. So have how do you with. really, uh, so then you have to prioritize, and I'm sure prioritizing if you have some type of domestic dispute and other types of things where you're going to be down officers or overtime. The uh, substance abuse and, unfortunately, the traffic issues can't be number one on the priority, I'm assuming. No, Maybe I'm wrong. Correct. They, right. they would barely be done. Uh, the number one priority is always an emergency call, right. somebody call 911. The second priority would be calls for service that are non-emergency, you know, kids drinking in the woods, uh, you know, an identity theft or my, right. you know, house was broken into today, it's not in progress, the person came home from work and discovered it. All those calls would still be handled, you know, there's no question of that. But none of the discretionary, uh, the substance abuse coalition, the school resource officers wouldn't participate in that anymore. Mm -hmm. The SRO could be pulled from the school and reassigned to a sector car. The crossing guards, every time they're absent, I send an officer to cover that crossing. It won't happen. So those are the impacts. Yes, Michael. Um, is there any kind of backup police coverage the town of Milton has available to it from, say, the state police? Yes. Things really got out of hand. If you know, we, if this went through, and you had to make those cuts, and you had like three calls, and so everything was, you know, you can you can you make can you call in backup from anybody? Yes, we use mutual aid on an emergency basis. Uh, it tends to only be a serious emergency or a large scale event. You know, I, I can't call Randolph and say you know respond to a B and E. Yeah, you know what I mean. And that works two ways. Um, it's used. It's certainly, uh, it would continue to be used. It works two ways. You know. If people are coming into our community, we're expected to go to their community, right. too. I understand. But it, it's usually very large-scale, very serious events. But it, it's happened many times in my career, yes. Okay, thank you. I'm coming to Steve, but if you don't mind, Maggie, I just want to clarify something that you that you said. Um, you mentioned the wish list, which we do say sometimes, but you, you were referring to the contingent budget request, and you said add two officers, but it's really to fund the two unfunded oh, positions. Right. right. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, Lee Michael, that's an important distinction only, only because, you know, I, I, I know Chief Graham mentioned, you know, there's 56 and his wish list would be more. We're not even at 56. We're, we're authorized for 56. We're funded at 53. So we're below even that basic amount, let alone asking for two. So the two I put in the contingent budget, us two that we're already authorized for, they just didn't get funded. Right. It's not even two additional beyond that. Okay. Thank you. Steve. So, Chief, as far as the cut to overtime, this isn't like traditional overtime, really, where whoever's working makes time and a half. This is overtime that someone's on vacation and someone else gets called in, or are they getting the time and a half? No, exactly. It's when somebody's backfilling. So it's the equivalent of you take a vacation day, uh, you take a sick day, you're out of work. So vacation days, personal days, you know, those are contractual obligations. You know, you're not denied those days. It creates a vacancy we backfill. You know, those we can kind of predict because we know how many vacation days, personal days, but there's always a dynamic in the sense, you know, Family Medical Leave Act is a common thing. You know, our department has a lot of women, a lot of people get pregnant, they could be out three months. That's a huge vacancy and we're forced to backfill it. Okay, so if you t take an average um, salary of one of your officers, divide that into 140,000, how many, how many, you know, staff hours does that relate to being unavailable? Well, it depends on the step. In other words, a new officer's only. On a, yeah, yeah, I, I understand. If you did an average and you said probably 70,000, 142, roughly it's two full time jobs. So 40 hours a week, 80 hours a week, times 52 weeks, essentially. Thank you. Richard? Actually, just a question for you. Did, is uh, Chief King coming back to talk about contingent budget at another date, right? 
I think just Michael and Amy are going to come in, but if we needed to bring somebody in, um, we, we could, but the plan is to not have the okay. department director. So if you do have a question, you can ask it now. My question for the continuum was just, so when you talk about, like, you want to have, or, you know, um, you know, if you were able to put that 142000 back into the budget and you're only at five or six cruisers on the street, what are we supposed to have? Like, so I live in East Milton. So, you know, there's, where there's always problem with parking and, you know, theft and things like that. So my question, at least from being a, you know, having a house in East Milton is, how many officers on the street is it that you can patrol appropriately? Well, there's two ways of attacking that issue. There's six assigned sectors, so if you have your staffing up, you can either get up to six and the advantage of that, you live in East Milton, there's a lot of traffic complaints and we assign that officer you know, go to Belcher Circle or Church Street and, you know, spend an hour there doing tickets. What's happening now is they get pulled away for calls. And if you, now if they're not covering one route, but four cars are covering six routes, they're going to get called away more often. So you can either staff it at six, which means they'll get called away less, or another way of attacking that is you can still say have five cover the six routes and take one designated person and say, I'm not going to call them away go to do Church Street, then go over the whole path, you know, then go up to Hillside Street and just assign them to traffic. So you know, I imagine essentially full time. So when you guys are putting together the continuum budget, this is the thought process that you're gonna be putting what you need into that. Yeah, my request on the contingent with the two positions as Maggie mentioned was uh, the two of the biggest demands I got, complaints I get from citizens, complaints I get from town officials. Uh, it was a huge part of the police chief screening when I went through it six months ago. And it's just a thing I say almost daily I deal with is traffic and drugs. And, you know, I, I mentioned it's a normally a department our size and a population our size doesn't have a full-time person dedicated to either. So my argument on the two is I could dedicate somebody to deal with the substance abuse, mental health issues, and somebody dealing with traffic okay. on a full-time basis. Thank you. Any other questions for the chief? Thank you for coming in. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. We're going to do DPW or public, public works, I should say. Good evening. How are you doing? Good evening. As much as I want to try to be as jovial as I often can be, not tonight, I'm afraid. The, um, the impact statement, I'm not sure if people have had a chance to, to review it, uh, is pretty, pretty devastating. Uh, I'm going to just paraphrase through it real quickly what these cuts that are being prescribed to the Public Works Department means to uh, deliver a service. Uh, unlike the police and fire, I'm not hitting bodies too hard, but I'm hitting programs that exist within that. And where I'm hitting um, the personnel is in the overtime availability for things that historically do crop up in the realm that we work in. Um, we often think of public safety as police and fire, but it, it is not hyperbole. Public Works is right there as well. When the, Tornado comes through, a microburst comes through, flooding, thunderstorms, branches down, motor vehicle accident at night, we have to clean it up. But, you know, we're, we're the ones who never know when that next call is going to come in and always results in an overtime call when it happens in the evening or after, uh, on weekends. So what I've done is, in, in, uh, in my impact statement, is giving you an order so it makes sense as you read through it as it follows my budget, but then in the very end, I've given you them by prioritization, meaning the one on the bottom is the one that's the least desirable to cut. So if you're, as we move through the process, those are the ones we would want to restore first. And I'll point those out as we go, okay? Uh, so to the um, first you, one. Would you prefer that I put up your um, your narrative instead of the slides? Do you have mine? Um, I'm pretty sure I have yes. you send it direct? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. That would make people at home be able to follow much cleaner as well as you folks. Lee Michael, thank you for the uh, movement of air. Sure. So just to talk quickly while you get that slide up, uh, Mr. Chair, um, we excluded the, the solid waste from um, the DPW budget. It's something that um, is contractually bound. I believe it's one, $1.3 million up there. So the 3.6% cut that I mentioned earlier <laughs> actually becomes a larger cut to the Public Works Department because we took out uh, the solid waste uh, 
expenses. Mm -hmm. So three point six being the target against the entire total DPW, but it escalates to five point six when you take those contractually bound uh, agreements that are in place. So in essence, what I'm going to be talking about is a five point six operational cut of what we would typically call discretionary, which we're going to find. Uh, services that are oftentimes considered essential or, or minimal at the upper end of the cut. That's correct. Yeah. That's correct. So, if you remember earlier, I came in uh, with a description of the forestry needs to replace trees that have been lost over the years. There's a concerted effort put in place. This cut represents not only the five thousand a cut of the five thousand dollars we were adding into this non-contingent budget to allow uh, a. a, a development or growth within that. I'm actually cutting the 5,000 that was there to begin with. So we, there will be no tree planting program other than those that uh, a volunteer uh, donated uh, or come in through grants. Uh, we're not gonna be able to have any other uh, funding for that. So that's $10,000 cut. Um, the next cut is a combination of grounds, buildings, other equipment and professionals. It's a total of $5,000. It's a, it's a real number, it's not a small number, but the reality is I have a garage door that breaks or a heating system that needs service. I can chew up that $5,000 in, in a couple of phone calls. And those are the things that happen. And inevitably, if those things don't happen, we're gonna be okay. If the, when any combination of those exceed the, the 5,000, um, we're gonna be coming back, back and asking for reserve front uh, transfer requests in the latter part of the year. I fear, I've heard it now in a couple of presentations earlier, we're all saying the same thing, that as we get further down the year, the, the, the burden placed on the necessity of reverse, uh, reserve fund transfers is only del potentially delaying the inevitable question of what do we do when we run out of money and yet still have the need. Right. So that's, um, that's the $5,000 cut I identify second. Um, I cut $12,000 from the salary and wage line in a very similar fashion. That's the overtime that I've typically had in the budget, historically what we spend for those emergency call-outs. You know, we don't know when a motor vehicle accident is gonna happen with a cleanup in the street. I have a four hour call-out. Um, a branch comes down, a tree comes down, we have uh, severe flooding. We, we talk about snow, snow and ice allows us to deficit spend, we all know that. Some of our biggest calamities aren't necessarily snow and ice, our big calamities are floods, Betty. Yep. Um, I point to Betty because she and I have stood in in water. Knee, deep, knee deep water before together <coughs> uh, in front of her house unfortunately um, it, it, you never know when that's going to happen so to chew up that twelve thousand dollars is almost inevitably going to result in a reserve fund transfer request in the latter part of the year if any one of these acts of nature come in or unforeseen things come in uh, I've, I've still left some cushion in there I'm not re cutting it completely I'm not that irresponsible, but the $12,000 is what I felt I needed to do in order to be able to balance the, uh, the prescribed cut that I needed to do. Uh, the next line, $24,000 um, labor. That is our summer hire program. We use the youth of, um, of Milton. We hire them just for the summer season. We pay them minimum wage. They do medial tasks like mow lawns, weed whack, prune bushes and hedges and, and whatnot. Um, those, without that $24,000 cut, I am now into making more substantial overtime and maybe even uh, portions of employees who need to be laid off for a portion of the year. It's a, it's a unionized labor force. I can't possibly be hiring summer kids to do work that's described within their job descriptions without potentially opening the town up to an unfair labor dispute which would be very difficult to defend. So it eliminates the $24,000 program. It eliminates the extra bodies. It's five, children, five young, young men and women uh, who provide these services. And lawns are gonna be growing a little longer and, and mowed less frequently. And, and maybe the trash is gonna be sitting on the ground a little bit longer. Um, and it's, it's really gonna affect the aesthetic appeal that this town is. Has, uh, has grown accustomed to expecting. At the very same, t same time, the public is asking that we do more in, in, in those regards. Um, kicking it solid waste, which is the, the, those are all in the public works realm. Uh, it, it, for the folks at home who don't know, public works is broken into various aspects. You folks all know that. The next part of the public works budget is solid waste. Uh, first cut I'm proposing there is uh, $62,000 from the solid waste general. 6200 6, Did I say 1000 Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Not that, not that flush. Um, Knockwood, we don't, we do not have a rodent 
concern at the DPW yard. It's going to reduce the frequency of rodent control at the yard from a monthly function to an every other month function, as well as those things that come up during the course of the year, solid waste, like when a, 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 a litter basket or a trash basket in the business that's going to either get vandalized or hit by cars. Or not sort of <coughs> we'll just be taking them out and not replacing them. And that's what that impact will do. Um, the next one, solid waste general, uh, is $11,900. That's, uh, that's from our salary and wage line. The recycle center is open the first Saturday of every single month. Uh, we will be opening it the first Saturday every other month. So it's a 50% reduction in access to the yard. We're not going to reduce volume. We're going to just have more volume coming through the yard in fewer days, but I won't have to have the overtime to cover that uh, at that, that time that it's open. Uh, similarly, on that same line, as we talked about this earlier, we have two vibrant business districts. Principally, it's Milton Village over by Adam Street by the Dorchester, Lowell Mills area, plus East Milton. Um, as a response to a request and pressures from uh, several years ago, Chamber of Commerce really made a concerted effort that we do a better job in emptying the barrels out and, and in implementing that program. We recognize that we need at least one barrel emptying during the weekend, uh, even though we empty them on a Friday that with the heavy traffic on Wednesday, excuse me, on Saturdays and on, on Sunday mornings, we needed to empty them again on Sunday. We're just going to elim eliminate the weekend emptying. Empty them on Friday night and empty them again first thing Monday morning, and if they're brimming on the weekend, it's what they'll have to be able to tolerate. So between those uh, two cuts, that's totaling the, the 11900 uh, we're getting into some drastic things now. Um, $30,000 I'm going to cut from the curbside recycling. If, if those weren't drastic enough, by the way. Uh, $30,000 we're going to cut from curbside recycling budget. Uh, what that ostensibly does is uh, we simply will not take televisions, computer monitors, refrigerators, freezers, air conditioners, or any other tank product, you know, propane, a helium, a, a oxygen tanks, and the things that we've been collecting for years. The little bit of revenue that we generate through sale of stickers versus the cost of managing and, and actually disposing those products is heavily, heavily subsidized by the town. And that's not to say that uh, people still have a need to get rid of them, but there are other alternatives. Every outlet that sells those products has a buyback program. Not a buyback, but a, you know, they'll charge you to remove uh, that product from your house. Um, the reason why it's more money is because those folks aren't being subsidized by anybody but the person who's paying to have it taken out. Um, so the ability for us to continue to offer the convenience to the town uh, is, is really at the breaking point. By eliminating that one program alone, I can, I can save $30,000. Go ahead. I wonder why this is prioritized so far down on your list if there is an option for residents to get that service by paying out of their own pocket for it. Do, can you speak to you, why you landed where it did? Uh, so this isn't the prioritized list. This is, sec this is budget oh. section by okay. budget section. The priority list is on the very last page. Yep. So as, as a, you hear the description and I talk about it and I, I ask as you people digest where the line might be drawn. I, most attention to the to what you heard and that's your priority at, number six that's correct okay pretty sorry far, pretty far down sorry about that so it's okay I, I tend to talk too much and not always point out the right document to help you guys look through it um, similarly central Maine is this is the at which is the next item there this is the last priority that I would would hope that you'd cut or the first to restore if you find that you're going in that direction. Um, what it really does is takes a look at, at the very same time that people in, in town are talking about the need to expand mechanical uh, repair services and, and perhaps even creating a new position which is in the contingent budget, uh, we're also being asked uh, to look at the, uh, uh, cost control and to just keep up where we are, we have to keep that garage open Saturdays and staffed. That's that's a thirty-five thousand. You know, it's right down to the dollar of you know, seven hundred three. But you know, it's thirty thousand seven hundred dollar value to keep it open. We just can't do that anymore. That will that, that'll have two effects. We'll continue to provide you know, triage by prioritizing emergency response apparatus, police and, and fire vehicles, uh, public works vehicles. Some all still fit on that priority. 
but repairs to other department vehicles are going to be even more compromised than they have been now. And at the same time, when those departments who use those vehicles during the business week, Monday through Friday, because we can make those repairs on the weekends, are no longer going to be able to have that, uh, that convenience and that we'll be taking that vehicle out of service during the work week and they're going to have to either use their own <coughs> private transportation, get reimbursed for it while the repair is being made. Um, that is, as you look at the prioritized list, that's my last cho uh, choice to cut. But again, it's just following the, the, the order in which my budget is, is okay. prepared. Uh, similarly, 7753, uh, there's nothing scientific about the 7753 other than when I <laughs> balanced my remaining target, I needed something to round it out to hit Mike's goal, his target. Uh, what it really comes right down to is the supplies in, uh, in, in the central maintenance garage. It, they, we may need to change oil a little less frequently, may need to extend the use of tires in three or four or five weeks longer on police cars. We'll just simply try to better manage our, our inventory control to make that number work. It, that's not as alarming as the one just above it, which is very alarming. But still, you did include in this one and several others that we didn't mention that you think that it's possible that a reserve fund transfer would be necessary. I didn't um, mention it. It's in my narrative. Right. But that's, you know, I don't want to keep saying it. I just want to point it out in case anybody didn't get a chance to read this because we haven't had it that long. I did read it, mm. and I noticed that that appeared many times on the cuts that you submitted, which is concerning. It, it almost became obnoxious as I kept it. It felt redundant and repetitive and, you know, to the border, even making me angry, putting it in, recognizing the well. I know the well is going to be dry. Yep. We can all see that happening, and, and I hear the theme coming from my colleagues in other departments saying the same thing. Um, and, and that's it. That, that's, that's all of the cuts described. I achieved Michael's target, uh, which is prescribed by Michael to me and from you folks to Michael to, for, for us to consider. And that last sheet really spells it right out. If we were to do it, the easiest one first, all the way down to the least uh, desirable, is just simply by the numbers on that left-hand column, working your way down. Richard? I just, I got to ask this question just because it <laughs> popped in my head while you were talking. So don't, I don't want anybody to take offense to the question, but um, when you talk about changing the barrels in, say, the business district, is that is that is that normal in every town that the town pays for um, their cleaning up those barrels? I only ask because, you know, I don't know what goes in there, but if it's in front of, let's say, a store or a Dunkin' Donuts or things like that, I'm assuming a lot of the trash comes out of those facilities. So, do in household trash. Sure, somebody cleaning their car up, maybe. Yeah, no, no, I mean <laughs> skimming the three dollar sticker. No, but is that is that typical of the towns in Yeah, I mean there's a there's a I, I, yeah, I don't know the answer. Mike would say yes. And the, the truth is, there's a certain municipal obligation to maintaining the aesthetic in your community and, and in your business district, keeping them clean, keeps them vi viable, keeps them keeps the vitality there. It's what feeds our tax revenue because we, we're very fortunate in this day and age to have a good two good downtown areas that a lot of communities don't have anymore. Uh, we, we still have one of you know, two of those. Um, when I said replacing barrels, as far as the... Oh, I got that, yeah. That's, those are damaged barrels. Yeah. No, I get it. I was yeah. just thinking, and sometimes you go to um, a convenience store or restaurant, and they've got barrels. Seemingly, they have their logos on them. I would assume they pay for those. So, Richard, just uh, not to be curt, um, we've had some issues with some of the, and I'm certainly not going to name names, and I'm not even going to try to suggest where well, you might even guess who the business is, but we had a barrel in front of a particular establishment who had a, had access to pe their patrons eating their product outside, um, and in that plaza area, they had no barrel of their own. Well, that's good. So we got the board of health. We got the board of health on that, and through an enforcement action through the board of health, we took care of that. So we don't. We're not just simply ignoring it. I have in, Steve and then Maggie. Oh, in Boston, ahead, there's eighteen hundred barrels. There's a dedicated crew. There's probably two large packers and six small packers that run the city. Sometimes Newbury Street, North End, Boylston Street. They'll run them three or four times a day. Uh, they unsuccessfully tried and adopt the barrel program, where you'd, you'd give bags to the business owner and have them maintain it, yeah. it it's not successful. Hmm. Yeah. It's, I, it, they, they attempt to at first, but ultimately, you know, for the cost of a bag, um, you entice them to start the program, but it, it fails, and ultimately, DPW ends up 
and ends up picking up the program. It, and Rich, to, to, to add on to, we, we always in our business try to consider other alternatives. Um, we had an opportunity to apply for and did apply for and got a grant to put those solar powered trash barrels, thought they sound extravagant. They were free. We put them in. The, the selling proposition there was you don't need to clean them as frequently or empty them because it compacts with everything that's disposed in it, it senses it, and so on and so forth. Uh, what was happening was compacting so long, and in the, in the, in the, not so much a problem in the winter time, but in the summer months, all you had is traction that that long with the odor coming out of it, it became a bigger problem. So you ended up emptying them every single day anyway. So even looking at something as innovative as that wasn't the solution. Steve? Comment and uh, question. Uh, as far as the um, not collecting of the curbside uh, recycling TVs and things like that, what happens when it gets expensive is they'll start appearing at the end of dead end streets where people just dump them out. It's true. And that's or, or they get buried in a yard or something. Steve's absolutely correct. I was <laughs> deliberately not sit broadcasting or advertising the possibility to vote. Sorry. Oh, they'll take later. them to Boston. They take them to Boston. We've done studies. We did studies in Boston that yeah. the surrounding communities in Boston that had a pay as you throw a program mm -hmm. or a sticker program. You know, the corner of Hilltop and Granite F, this TV's. Every week out there, it's just you, know, you can't put a name on it. An enforcement officer wouldn't be able to identify whose TV or laptop it was, or you know, um, you know, whose propane tank it was. It's they they end up in communities that that don't pay. For the senior point is well taken. Yeah. There there will be some back pressure on that. So then the question, and I'll shoot this right over your head: <laughs> um, the cost of trash continues to go up. The cost, of the the revenue from recycling is flat or is shrinking it's a place where there's an opportunity for revenue growth is there any consideration on the trash sticker fee being increased <laughs> we're going to shoot that right back at okay <laughs> yeah so that's something i'm exploring um it's it, the pay as you throw program is very successful in in um diverting trash to recycling it's a lot cheaper to get rid of uh recycling materials from a processing point. Um, however, you still have to run trucks through that route. Um, the hauling, the, the cost to haul material is actually um, more expensive than the cost to dispose of material these days. Landfills are looking for material. Uh, people are recycling more. Landfills like the one in Braintree or the one in Dedham, need, they need, they need those tons. Um, they're looking for that. Um, but to answer your question, yes, that, that's something we're taking a look at. Um, from a guy who, who stops down at the treasurer's office every Tuesday. Luckily, it's more convenient for me now to purchase stickers. Um, I'm a fan of the, the annual sticker, um, but Joe and I have, have had some dialogue with the town accountant about uh, revisiting uh, where the sticker program lies and, and how to maximize. Um, you know, when, you, when you're looking for revenue in a town that's, that's slightly restricted, um, and, and it's a program that's successful, and the last thing we want is, is to increase um, the tonnage on the street uh, because it costs more per ton. I mean, it, it's, it's about 12x um, to get rid of a ton of trash as it is to a, a ton of recycling. It's, it's something that, that definitely we're looking into. The um, one it won't eight, hit for 18, it would hit for 19. Yeah. And I was just going to suggest something that you just t touched on, and Amy could chime in. Even if we would consider such a thing, that is a revenue which doesn't, since we're not enterprise with trash. That wouldn't go directly to offsetting this trash discussion mm -hmm. immediately. That would actually have to be shown up as projected revenue in an, in a future yeah, year. But it still so, helps. But it would be really it's a, about a, almost a six to a twelve month um, lag lag time before you can even begin to understand how how that affects the budget. Yeah, I think the current number is about nine hundred thousand dollars in revenue mm -hmm. for, the, for the trash sticker program. Um, Just we'll about take a look at it and, and, and see if we you know if, if it makes sense. Uh, how far north and, and if it's worth it from a, from a disposal perspective. Thank When's you. the last time it was raised? 2000. 2000? 2003. Okay. Maggie? I, I, I don't think we've seen that too. Oh. It's, uh, <clears throat> Can you guys hear? Oh, Tom, why don't you come to the table? Uh, uh, but, yeah, part, part, of the, part of what we've seen in that is there's been diminishing revenue recently in, tra in, in trash stickers uh, revenue. It, some of it could be because people are recycling more, but some of it's definitely because in the hotter economy, even though it's only three bucks, people try and beat the system. And the more you increase it, the more people are going to try and beat the system. Uh, and it's expensive to try and enforce it. 
I mean, it's at, at some point you get diminishing returns. So you got to be careful. There's an optimum level, I think, uh, of, of how much you can raise that fee before it just gets untenable for people. Okay. Yeah, Richard. Would you start looking into other options then at that point? Mike and I have had several conversations. Be away from stickers into other things. That there's everything from a from a flat fee, do away with a sticker, and don't worry about managing it, and, and concern yourselves with the tonnage increases, uh, all the way down to increasing sticker prices to hybrids of anything in between, um, offering a a discounted annual sticker uh, for, for for one particular tier of folks, and then and maybe a different tier for for another. So. The, all of those things have been talked about, and, and none of which have, uh, have left to the administrative level and gone to the selectmen yet. Okay. But we, we have considered those. We've recognized that you know, there's, there's an opportunity perhaps to raise some money, but it's not the panacea by any means. Other questions for Public Works? Maggie. I'm, I'm not certain who to direct this at, but um, I'm sure whoever has the answer can let me know. I'm reading Joe's impact statement. And I'm curious as why the, I know that the solid waste, it says that it's uh, taken out of the equation because it's something that they need to do all the time, but are all the other departments having these type of items taken out of their equations when you're making cuts? Because I think you mentioned it's 5.6% of the budget. But when I go to, I think this is Amy's sheet, with, and I'm looking down as far as the percentages, and your general works department is, I think, percentage with the 525 on the high side, 5.97, but you list the solid waste at 3.49, and then there's the, no, I'm sorry, 0.66, and then the vehicle maintenance, 3.49. I'm curious why those three items were broken down separately as opposed to showing the total percentage of public works what you're presenting, what you're cutting, and why, um, I guess, certain things are being taken out of the equation. So uh, that was my way to narrate and describe what the real, what I felt to be the real effective impact. So um, not to take it out of the equation, because it's very much in the equation, but when, de when a department will sit up here and say, my cut is X number of percent, well, theirs is their their price and that's it. But when you take a big, big item like solid waste, you know, 1, 1. 1.4 million, 1.38 million, uh, that's fixed by contract, it re and I have no flexibility to trim there, leaves that smaller portion of pie left only to make those cuts. So that's where it has that dramatic effect. You may not believe in that, that approach, because you might say, well, solid waste is left intact, we're not going to touch you, and that's, it shouldn't be out of the equation. But it measures to the folks, to you people and to the folks at home that those areas that they see as the direct service, those are the very limited areas where these cuts can come from. And, and it has a more dramatic effect because of that. That's what I was looking to demonstrate there. Then why are we seeing like cuts under the solid waste on the on this sheet? So under the oh, I'm sorry. So the second part of your question uh, is that not all of my solid waste is covered under a contract. The collection of the trash by Sunrise Scavengers Trucking, the disposal of that trash to a landfill, or the disposal of the recycled product to a recycle center are covered under annual contracts. Those are the fixed annual contracts based on um, that five-year contract that we signed three years ago. Um, there are other things like the operation of the recycle center, the emptying of trash barrels, and, and, and those other services that we provide that aren't within the realm of those contracts. Okay. Thanks. So back to Steve's point. To your point, Steve, it, 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 we're entering, in fiscal year 18, we're, we'll be entering the fourth year of a five-year contract. So that stuff needs to be put on the table now so that if, when we entertain a new RFP, that scope of work captures some of the changes that we want to get to try to get that 1.4 and, and the shortfall that we have somewhere to make it almost like a, a, a zero-sum game, um, which is very hard to do in most communities. Any last question for Joe? Thanks, Joe. Appreciate it. Thank Sorry you you're not sure. getting a round of applause. <laughs> yeah. It's not over yet. Will Adam check. Do you want to join us at the table? Mother Nature heard how tough things were, and they were helping you guys. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Have a good night. Is it my camp? Mm -hmm. Yes. Wednesday. Hi, Will.
Good you were evening. late. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll try to be brief. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, cuts to the library. I'm going to concentrate more on the higher end cuts than the lower end cuts um, <coughs> for this. But regardless uh, of any of the proposed cuts, uh, we will be seeing um, reductions in library services uh, for the community uh, and reductions in the times that those services are available. Um, you know, I've come before you and talked about uh, how successful um, the library has been in uh, growing in usage uh, over the last several years. Um, we've seen you know 5% increase in the number of people through the door. 50% increase in the people attending our programs. Uh, so, the, so we are in a growth industry, um, but we're not able to keep up with that growth. Uh, and another thing I just want to preface um, the impact statement with is that we do have 2.5 vacant positions already uh, not funded in the non-contingent budget. Um, and, and one other thing, you know, compared to uh, departments that have come, come before me, um, tonight, uh, we, we're working with uh, a lot less people, too. Uh, we only have about 15 FTE at the library, so it's, uh, it's a smaller pool of people. So, um, you know, it, it was a difficult decision, um, but one of the impacts to the library would be uh, laying off one of, uh, one of that, uh, those staff members. <coughs> um, this uh, reduction in staffing, uh, would need uh, a, a rethinking of our staffing levels when we could staff. We would not have uh, adequate staffing to continue to operate the current number of hours that we're, we're open right now. Um, right now, it looks like we would reduce our hours on uh, Wednesday nights during the year. Um, so we would be down to uh, three nights a week um, instead of the four <laughs> we're at now. Um, that is one reduction. Um, the other reduction would be the elimination of summer Saturdays. This is a smaller number of actual days. It's still a significant number of hours, but it would reduce access uh, to the library on weekends for the entire summer. So that's two months out of the year. If you are, are, are working, can't get out of Boston or, or wherever you might be, uh, that the access to the library and our services would be greatly reduced. Um, overall, uh, what these reductions would look like would be over 260 hours of reduced operating time. So it would be a close more than 260 hours or you know, roughly about 30 odd days uh, if you look at an eight hour day. Uh, we'd be close to um, 23,000 checkouts or circulation figures uh, based on our current numbers for the time periods, you know, Wednesday nights, Saturdays. Um, so it would be a loss of access to the building, um, a loss of uh, ability to check out materials. Uh, in addition, as I've said at other um, presentations, our meeting rooms are heavily used both by the library for programming and by community groups, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, soccer, whatever, crew. There'd be less opportunity um, to use those rooms both for programming for the library and for these groups. Uh, we're booked every night, our, our main room and often our smaller room by either the library or one of these groups. So we'd be reducing um, significantly the amount of time people have uh, those available to them. Um, so again, this was pretty brief and to the point. Uh, it's, it's not as long a list, but it's a very significant list for the library. Um, as I said, we have vacant positions already. Um, the personnel committee has uh, realized the, uh, the growth that the library has seen over the last several years. Um, the library trustees have been uh, great advocates uh, on behalf of the library uh, to increase the staffing to meet the demands of, uh, of our, our residents. Uh, big step backwards for the library. When we're trying to grow our staff, we'd be reducing the staff and we'd be reducing the availability of our library and our services uh, to the entire community um, starting July 1st. Thanks, Will. Thanks. Any questions for Will? Yes? Do these figures take into consideration the, the reduction in the, in the money that you get for the costs of everything that, you know, the cost of books and the cost of... So, I think you're referring to the state aid yeah. requirements. So, with these 
reductions, um, there's a number of factors that can go, go into state aid. The most important ones are the municipal appropriation requirement, which we would still satisfy uh, that, um, that statute. The other important one is the materials expenditure requirement. Um, with this cut, we should be, um, we should be all okay with that. Okay. All right. yeah. Will? Yes. Your proposal includes a uh, reduction in electricity expense? That's my... Old proposal? That would be my lower proposal, the one percent proposal. So, if um, I assume the reduction in hours still exists in the higher end proposal, wouldn't you still be able to reduce the electricity under that scenario, or no? I would hope to be able to reduce uh, the electricity under that scenario, but it wouldn't have been enough to. Re I needed to cut more from my budget than I would have been able to cut out of the electricity. That's what it came down to. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Uh, it was brief but important. Thank you for thank coming. Thank you very much. Thank you, Will. Thank you. Yeah. Solidated facilities, are you going to handle that one, Mike? Sure, yeah. yeah. Uh, no, I thought it was okay. He's here. Oh, he's he's here. You're sitting behind, behind a post. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> it must need to be repaired. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Welcome. So, so basically, obviously, you know, we, the, the same thing, the theme here tonight, you know, we met a few times and we had to make some cuts and make some deeper cuts. So my deeper cut was a 2%, $20,000. So I'd like to just, just to say right out, a brand new department started five years ago. We are a success story. We work very hard. We do a lot, you know, we do a lot for, for you know, for a little, all my guys, uh, I couldn't even think about cutting staff. The only, so one of the biggest cuts, I said, what, I wanted to cut from things I could cut from, and that was uh, the biggest biggest impact. The $9,500 was cut half of the uh, seasonal helper. The impact in that, though, was that you still got to cut the grass, you still got to clean up, you still have to do emergency calls when the, when the contract cleaners are not here. If there's an emergency, we have to take care of that. That could be that. What could the impact there could be? My roofer, who's doing roofing, has to come down to cut the grass. It's not. It's, you would never do that in the real world. That's you know, or take the carpenter or take a light electrician. But that's the reality. I have to cut. So I wanted to cut the things that I really could. I didn't really want to touch my budget, you know, because I work with all the departments. I work with the fire department, the libraries, the schools, and we try to use the money I have to kind of offset things that come up. You know, there's 925,000 you know square feet of property. It's a lot. I could do use another million dollars in my budget, a million dollars. Never mind trying to cut twenty, but I just so I looked at so that so ninety five hundred dollars would come from the reduction of uh, seasonal help. Five thousand dollars would come out. I have a professional service line item, which I would hire a licensed uh, engineer or architect for specialized projects to do uh, green communities grants. Or if I had an engineering uh, issue, I would call somebody in as an expert. Uh, Consultant, so I think I, I would take that off the table. When I do capital projects, I always put engineering services in there anyway on a capital project. But for things that I try to plan on, the things that would be on be my expertise, um, I'd have to cut from there. A reduction of four thousand dollars would be for my overtime uh, line item. Um, it's just in a way I, I can kind of control it. So my line item for overtime is mostly for snow removal, for things that we have to do after hours. You know, we try to work in schools, we try to work in the libraries, we try to work in areas where people already occupy. Sometimes you just can't do that because it's a major disruption. So you have to do it after hours, a Saturday or a Sunday. So I would just have to kind of strategically plan all my, uh, all my, my uh, PM projects around, you know, around people in, in different times and tell people you have to kind of leave the room for me to do, uh, do work. In the final reductions, $1,500 would come from meeting expenses, offices, supplies, and postage. So I just try to, you know, look at where I could cut, have a little control, and still try to run it. You know, I just, it, it just, it's a sad, it's a sad, you know, the real sad scenario, I guess. I mean, that's all I can say. A brand new department with success. We save thousands of dollars every year. Uh, we bring in, you know, since I've been here, you know, putting solar panels on here, green communities, almost $800,000 in grants. I mean, that's a lot of my time. This is very frustrating for me because I, you know, really thought for all the hard work that we do that, you know, I would have to cut my budget. I, I want to grow my budget. Yeah. I want to get a license, uh, a licensed carpenter, another helper. So this is this is kill. This is really killing me. So I'm, I'm very passionate what I do. Been here for 17 years. I just never thought that this is 
you know, how my job would come. Uh, you know, just, I don't know what to say. But it's 20,000. I know he's, you know, you know, seeing the police and DPW and the fire about their devastating cuts, about public safety. It's sad for all of us. But, you know, because we all support one another and it's just, uh, it's grim. So. Um, would you also say that having some specialists on staff enables the town to save money? versus hiring that out. That's where that savings comes from that you're talking about, right? Uh, well, yeah, well, I mean, I'm, you know, I, when, I, when I just was trying to build my budget and trying to bring some more expertise into the department, and I set, set would be before going through the budget process. You know, a licensed electrician in house that, that we spend $75,000 for, we look at all the hours that that person puts in, it's like 150,000 if I had to bring somebody in, mm -hmm. and that's only when I'm calling them. Yep. And that does not include my staffing time, I can't, if, you know, if Mike, you know, obviously was the, the, the electrician, somebody has to walk around him. That's another staff person has to walk. He just can't, mm -hmm. can't get the keys and go ahead and do what you want to do. So we're not leaning on any specialists with these cuts, but you did, you did say you might have to backfill with some of your specialists. And I'm wondering if, if you anticipate that the town would actually end up spending more money in the end by making Wait, some of these cuts. So what I meant by that statement is that, you know, so in-house in we have a, a roofer. So he obviously he's a... Uh, uh, He's not a licensed roofer, but he, you know, he's a, he's a certified roofer. So somebody's got to cut the grass. So if a guy's on vacation, and obviously, you know, and we have to do things, we have to just kind of move. So I have to prioritize my job. A little bit. It's different. It's just, you know, so I have to kind of move. Things have to get done. I mean, it's 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 maintenance. Other questions for Bill? Yeah, Steve. Bill, one n number one and number three here. Yeah. Um, they look to me like cuts that would wind up back in front of us with maybe a multiplier um, from having to, you know, provide some of these services through contracts instead. Um, and, you know, maybe a hit to the reserve fund for, for more than that. Uh, am I wrong or? Well, I've been in this job for five years. I never came to you for a reverse on transfer. Other than when we first started out, we wanted to do an engineering study. So I really look at it. So a lot of it is trying to do a lot of planning ahead of time and trying to say how do you cut the grass. I work very closely with the school department in the summertime. You know, if thank God the school department pays for, you know, they hire almost 13 kids to come in the summertime to cut the grass to, to kind of work with us. Thank God they help us. Thank God for the contractors like Johnny Driscoll who cuts the town hall and for the library. Thank God I'm not paying for that. Mm -hmm. That'd be another $25,000 worth of time. We have a lot, so we, we do a lot in this department trying to work with people to help out. You know, we have the Lloyd landscape, and not, you know, not I want to take the opportunity to get shuttles, but that's what you want. We we do a lot of the people that try to, you know, do all these all these freebies for us that we're not really just not in this budget. I mean, thank God for these other these landscapers who help out. But not so much on the landscapers, but if you're if your guys are doing landscaping and not doing a roof, you're going to have to hire somebody when that roof eventually starts to leak, or is it, you know, can you just kick that down the road and hope that nothing happens well, we, for a fiscal year? You try to prioritize your jobs. I mean, you know, every day, you know, when you're running this many square footage and you have a lot of older buildings on the town side, and even the school side, schools ain't, they're not old. I mean, they're, you know, they're not new anymore. They're 14, 15 years old. The technology's failing. We do, we just, every day we just get, you know, 30, 40 workers, and we just try to prioritize all our jobs based on the skill set. That's why it's critical for me, somewhere down the line, to get this licensed carpenter, you know, and, and to get more staff. I don't like putting my licensed uh, electrician or my, my licensed heating guy up on a roof when nobody else is around. They're, they're working with some serious power. They're all by themselves. The roof's soaking wet. That's a real dangerous situation. That's why I was trying to get a help out. So, God forbid, something happened, somebody could, call, could not notify us. Mm -hmm. Don't have that ability. It's so tough. So, we, yeah, it's just, you know, it's, how do you explain, you know, it's a brand new department. You know, it's uh, any kind of my department is devastating because I'm trying to build my budget. You mean so? Anybody else? Yes. So Jane? I think you gave us before, but I'm not sure. For every dollar we're going to cut from your budget, how much more is it going to cost us? Well, what it comes down to is just deferring maintenance. That's enormous cost. There's no, there's no number on that. But like you know, we, I will. All, you know, I've been here for 17 years. I'm passionate in my job. I will make this department work. Yeah, I, I have to make it work. Yeah. But it's going to defer maintenance, and that's a cost down the line that somebody's going to pay for. Mm -hmm. You mean anybody can maintain a house, but eventually, if you don't clean the leaves from the gutters, mm -hmm. it all backs up and walks out 20 years more, that gutters are going to fall off the house because you never did anything. So I'm just you def 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 deferring Back maintenance. Peddling. But I have to yeah. learn, you know, and thank God I have a lot of experience, and I can mix and match and, you know, and ask for volunteer help and, you know, just do the best I can with the dollars I have to manage. That's all I can do. 
Thank you. Oh, yep. Go ahead. Just a quick one. Are we um, putting off um, projects that could result in lower utility bills? No, I think I think as a, I'm a, you know, I'm not I'm not the energy manager for the town, but I, I do have one of those hats. No, I've done. Oh, yeah, you've, got a, you've done a lot. I've just, done. We've I've, done. I'm just because oh, of your comment about deferring. Yeah, those aren't the things that no. are deferred, are they? As a matter of fact, I'm working with you know with you know my one of my supervisors here and Bill Clark for the Green Community, which we're applying for another grant for three hundred thousand dollars. We always do the grants. I have a million dollars worth of grants on the table and awesome. try to pick one. Which one. We're doing everything we can to stretch the dollars. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Maggie, this is before my time, but. Uh, maybe someone can explain to me the reasoning. I know I think the consolidated facility is an excellent idea, all under one roof. But I know the majority of the percentage is uh, the work gets done for the school department because they're, they're a larger department. Why is the town side paying for, for the salaries of all of the employees? Why wouldn't that be split like the town side does for certain departments if you're sharing maybe a secretary or a clerk? Why is the town side paying for all of consolidated facilities' salaries? Uh -oh. so, so maybe, so I, I think, so I just think you want to go back a little bit, you know, and I'm not going to, I know, and I, and I, and I answered the, 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 the town and you know, the town and the schools. We started this department, and thank God this, I came from the school department. My mm -hmm. salary was moved over. And they also gave us a heating ventilation technician, and they also gave us uh, a maintenance uh, a maintenance man. They gave us some overtime uniform money. On the town side, Joe Lynch was nice enough when we first started to give us two of his people. So we've only so five out of the ten of us, five was came was already already budgeted. No, I think the Maggie to clarify, the schools did use to pay for several of the employees, but when the consolidated department was created the budgets were reduced for the schools and reduced okay. for other places where those staff existed and then the consolidated facilities budget was created with a new fund to to replace those people that were removed from other places but so it doesn't day, look it doesn't look like they are currently paid for by where they're performing work but they were essentially removed from those departments and the money for them was removed from those departments as well which should be done i agree but now as we go along and the years start Accumulating, it's a very nice deal just to have to pay for materials and not have to pay for any labor or uh, any of the benefits of anyone. You're just calling it. And then the town side, we're going to keep incurring all of these additional expenses as they grow. Does that seem fair? I, I'm not certain. All one town, Maggie. Yeah, I think, it, town. I think it would be great if we could yeah. start talking about it as, as one set of requests for the whole town and one budget for the whole town as opposed to saying the schools are getting more than their fair share, et cetera. It doesn't seem to help us to, to focus on that. You know? No, well, every department within the town talks about splitting a secretary, so why should that be any different? Or a clerk, we are one budget. I'm just talking about the fairness of it all, as all of the other departments do. That's basically it. Yeah, and I'm not, you know, I said I... No, I don't know who would answer it, yeah, just something I, just I thought of when you were talking. We do what we do. I've been, I've been in... Oh, this, and you do a great job. I've been in this field for 35 years. My, I show up every day, mm -hmm. and I look at every building, no matter who owns it. Right. That's part of my job, and all my guys. And we prioritize the workload, and thank, and thank God that we can do that, because school, if we had to build the schools again today, it'd be 300 oh, million, yeah. not 150. So we're trying to maintain it and trying to prolong the life of these school buildings. So, you know, it's a win-win for everyone. Last question. Bill, thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate, appreciate your help. Thanks, yeah. thanks for all your hard work. Thank you. Guys, thanks, tough job. Thank you. Amy and Michael, do you want to address the other departments that are summarized? Sure, yeah. We can, we can go through it quickly. Uh, some of them were addressed in, in the $300,000 cut. Um, the assessors, uh, he identified um, that, that number for us prior to coming um, last week. And, and let me just start by saying so, some of these numbers um, you know, I had mentioned the Board of Health number earlier. You can take Board of Health, uh, Cemetery, and Parks. Um, those are subject to the, the trustees and even the library, the trustees meeting um, and, and identifying those cuts. These are just numbers that, that we identified. Um, I know Trace Desmond's, Desmond said that the, the cemetery trustees don't meet again until March 22nd. Um, and the proposal um, that, that we put forth that 18434 she would have to present to the trustees of the cemetery then. But um, 
it, as you can see, it's it's eighty thousand dollars for the for the uh, ten ten plus departments. Uh, information technology. We talked to Jim Sugroy. Um, he's going to uh, have to uh, not order a software uh, update. Um, I don't think it was a townwide program, but more so um, department specific. And I'll and I'll get that for you. Um, the veterans we talked about in in the in the three hundred thousand dollar number that hasn't changed. Um, what what are we cutting for the selectmen's department? So the selectmen, the treasurer, collector, the warrant committee, those I just went back on a detailed level and looked at the general expenditures and looked at FY16 and kind of did an average and grossed them up and it looked like maybe they could be cut a little bit um, to bring them to the fiscal 16, some of them. I've given you another list yep. with all the, and I didn't bring that with me. Some of them were like plus 20%, plus 10 So it looks like there was um, a large increase projected without really a good narrative as to why. So I just tried to bring those into line a little bit more with FY16. Um, I think the selectman was on the other miscellaneous line. Treasurer collector, I believe, was do you have it up there if it was I don't remember seeing the selectman on here. It's one line. It doesn't have a subtotal, I believe. It's on there. Okay. It's all linked. Um, it's probably down the bottom. Oh, yep. Just reducing all other to actual 16 plus 10 percent. Yeah, and then the treasurer collector there. I can't read what what line items, but it was it looks like professional services, and he has a miscellaneous line too. Yep. Um, same with warrant committee. Mm -hmm. Even though that's only a little bit, again, we were looking for every penny we could find, and that was just bringing it to FY16. Um, again, Board of Health, they, we haven't even discussed that with them. They, um, we were just, again, looking where we could find. Same with Council on Aging. I believe some of her numbers look like maybe she could reduce a little bit. Um, I can't, again, I can't see the line item. FY16 plus 3 percent. Yeah, for Council on Aging, it says fuel and oil and Boston gas. Yeah, so if you looked at the 16 on her budget submission compared to what the request was for 18, I, I felt like we could cut it somewhat mm -hmm. with minimal impact. Just a quick question. Yep. What is, um, the ones that have trustees, what does that mean when you have to have them currently? Well, they're a separate board or committee that does not fall under the jurisdiction of the Board of Selectmen. Okay. So we cannot, the Board of Selectmen cannot, they, they are separate from the Board of Selectmen. So can Selectmen. they say no? No. Okay. The, not, the to the not to the number. Not to the number. Right. But they can not, move the money. Right. Not to the number. Okay. Yeah. The strong town administrator can't dictate a cut to them, but he's making a suggestion as to how yeah. to best divvy it up. But then it would be up to the individual boards to vote what to do if the Warren Committee decides to make okay. those cuts. Okay. Yeah. Was there a question? Good question. I, yep, yeah, it's, it's may, and it may have nothing to do with it, but it's on the cemetery. Um, you know, the perpetual care fund that they have, that they earn income from it, and they've just been plowing it back in. And we asked about it, and they said that they, that was in response to a, a suggestion from a past warrant committee, but I don't know how far past, and I don't know at what point we ought to take that up again as to whether they should start peeling some of that money out of the interest revenue from the perpetual care fund and you know using it because you know any dollar that's not coming from that is coming from the tax levy um, and you know that's money that could help some you know in some, in some other areas so um, you know it's going to be late if they're not meeting until March 22nd to do anything about it maybe there's, uh, it just doesn't it does, doesn't sit with me to not look at every uh, possibility and that certainly seems to be one to me do we know? Do we know how much it is? Um, how much is it now? Yeah, I sent it. I think there's about ninety-seven thousand dollars in there, if I'm correct. No, I think oh. in the perpetual right. care. No, there's a, there's no. a significant balance, but you need to talk to the trustees because I don't know all of the um, laws around it, but it's set up for the perpetual care of grave sites, so they need to ensure that they have funds. Forever, right. mm -hmm. and, already, and that's why they stopped they taking money out of so it because they're not making any interest on it. Not the interest rates went down so much, and I believe that was around the time when they 
they noticed that they really weren't earning any interest and they kept taking you know seventy thousand out a year and um, that was a different thing. okay but um yeah you would really need to talk to the trustees about that because i'm sure there's reasons why uh, it may be restricted to what they can use it for I was just looking for an email. I, I thought Therese had, had responded back with something. She did send some stuff. But I can't remember what the total was anymore. I think it's a restricted fund. Yeah, she did. I remember. I don't have that with you. Okay. And she did plan on being here. She's, she's ill tonight, so we hope she's feeling better. And I believe um, the majority, the feedback that we got from them, so although they haven't voted, was that they were going to consider um, reducing overtime on weekends, which could affect... Um, funeral services on Saturdays. Are they going to close on Saturday? Right? Well, they it. stopped short of saying they were going to close on Saturday, but they worded it as they were going to consider reducing overtime, which would affect their Saturday hours, okay. their Saturday overtime hours. But again, um. that has not been approved <laughs> by the trustees. It was right. just. I believe one of the members and Trace, one or two of the members, so it wasn't the whole board has had not come to an agreement on that. But that's the level they were talking about. I believe Parks was also overtime and seasonal mm -hmm. help too. Are there any departments that haven't been cut? It seems like you've made a cut like a to just about everyone. I'm just well, there curious. are, but they're more um, the administrative departments. Um, if you, if you look down, like my department is central business. I don't, I have a very um, low level of general expenditure appropriation. There's really nowhere to cut. Right. Um, um, leash law falls under police, so he already took more than his share of cut. Per personnel board, planning town board, <clears throat> town clerk's office. Um, so there are Three a few, million. you know, there are a few that just mm. their budgets are so small. It's just Two. three million two hundred ninety-five. No, I'm just saying it looks like you guys yeah. really we put tried a lot of thinking into this. So that's we why did. We, it yeah. was what did we meet five, six times with departments? Okay. Uh, I mean, we've gone over it with a fine tooth comb and. So we have the perpetual care fund on the screen, and uh, Therese wrote that in 2012 it had approximately $2 million in it, and that at the time the trustees determined that they were transferring from the perpetual care fund to the town two to four times what was being collected from the previous fiscal year. So they were actually draining it rather than, than building it. Um, and they went on to establish uh, a policy of depositing 70% of the cost of a grave to the perpetual care fund and 30% of burial rights. Today, the balance is $3,295,000. Yes. Um, any, news, any news on health care? I'm, I'm thinking about big budgets. Any changes? Nothing that would change your view on what that number would be? That number is already in at level with, with 17. Odds are. Just ask them. You don't yeah. have to defend yeah. it. Just, no, okay. I mean, still any, kind of early. Any revenue? Uh, have you looked at revenue again? Or do you, you're, you're ironclad that this is what you think it's going to be? Well, we met yeah. with um, Glenn Pavlicek. Michael, myself, I don't remember if Anne Marie was still around. That was only two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Anne Marie was not there. Um, that was just a few weeks ago, wasn't it? Um, and we went through all of the logic, how the methodology, how we determine those numbers, similar to what we presented here into the Board of Selectmen. And at that time, um, Glenn agreed that they looked reasonable. So there's nothing. No changes. That, no, not that make, makes me comfortable changing anything at this point. Any other questions? We need to pivot to talking about the non-contingent budget until I would say at least 1030, um, because we have, we have a really aggressive schedule to get the warrant finished. And uh, 
we had planned to spend three-ish hours on that tonight. Um, so I don't know if we're going to end up having to add a meeting or not, but um, let's talk about that after we've discussed for a little while. Is there anything else before we pivot to that discussion from the Board of Selectmen? No? Okay. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Amy. Thank, Thank you, you for having us. Thank you. Do you folks happen to know we're rushed, need to take a, a five-minute break, or shall we just jump right in? Just jump right in. Okay. So here's the, the, here's the spreadsheet that I created um, that we went over last week. Uh, it's a worksheet for us to yeah. start tallying up suggested cuts so that we can see how far we have to go to get to $1.5 million in reductions. Changes that I made to the second tab include detailing out all of the different line items that were just presented to us from the town so that as we make a decision to cut a position or cut funding for something, we can carry it over to this spreadsheet and, and have it tie back and see just exactly where, where cuts are coming from. Um, DBW is a little tricky because of the way his budgets are assessed. Um, so on the sheet, you see town administrator priority. A one means those are the cuts that the town administrator suggested on the lower end of his cuts. A two means go to those cuts second. If we're going to cut higher, he gives uh, more priority to cutting, cutting the ones or twos. DPW, I, I just took Joe's ordering and, and didn't factor in what um, the town administrator's suggestion was on that. And I ordered his one through 15. You'll see they're not numerical because some of them um, the way that his budgets are broken out, there were two or more cuts in one budget. And so I collapsed them for the, the sake of ease, but I wrote out what the impacts will be on the side. Um, if we need to sp split those out later, we can. But you have the detail in front of you from what he passed out. So this is the summary of the departments that we have. And we have to make cuts in this summary of departments that total $1.5 million. I have some thoughts about how to start that process, but I'd like to hear if anybody else has thoughts first, so I'm not railroading anybody. <laughs> Richard? No. Yeah, it. Others? We, we gave a range of cuts to the schools and the non-school departments. And we said, please provide us with detail about what the cuts would be in this range. So if we want to go in and now apply the minimum cuts, that would show us how much area we have left to work with. That's not to say that it would be definite that all those minimum cuts would be applied, but that would at least give us a starting point to see how much more cutting we have to do and would be detailing out where we can move money around or cuts around if we wanted to. So for instance, the schools, I, I think that at the lower end of their cut, <coughs> it was just around a million dollars or something like that. I have to look back at what their actual number was. Um, if I look on this sheet, the two lines I put in for the schools were, oh, 975 for their initial cut, and then to get up to their max non-contingent cut that we gave them would be the addition of up to another $225,000. So that, for instance, maybe we want to start by putting in a number close to 975 for the schools and start working our way around that number. Is it acceptable? Is it not acceptable? What does that cause us to cut in other areas of the budget to meet the 1.5? Thoughts? I'm going to grab some water while you absorb that. <laughs> I think they should start higher. Start at 6535. He's starting at the very lowest, 6535. I think it should be higher. Well, the percentage. Maybe, yeah. I think that's true. Based upon all the impact. So the two columns that are in the middle of the sheet, TA suggested cuts one and TA suggested cuts two, correspond to what's on that second sheet that prioritize them. So under the TA's first scenario, where the town, the non-school budgets are 
um, are getting cut less, and the or the town budgets are getting cut 20 percent, and the schools are getting cut 80 percent. That's TA suggested cuts one. TA suggested cuts two is the flip of that scenario, um, and then we can completely disregard that if we want to and create our own list entirely. But that's there so that you can have a record. <laughs> yes. You're raising your hand. I, yeah, I was going to say. Um, yeah, I'm just focused on the percentages. <laughs> so I want to pick a percentage and then go, let's assume it's not scenario one or scenario two, it's scenario three, somewhere in between. Mm. That's good. And then kind of go from there. I, I don't know, just how my brain works. So. Like halfway point or something. If the school department is accepting 65% of the cut, that would be $975,000. Which is pretty close to what you have. Is that 97? 97, mm -hmm. 97. Right. Are you talking? Can I ask? No. Yes, Richard? Are you, are you talking about like the buckets of school in town? Or are you talking percentages across the board? Percentage. I'm talking about the buckets. This is just how my brain works. What percentage is the school going to get? What percentage is the town going to get? Okay. And then I'll finish the thought. I don't know anything about running a school. So I think we'll just accept their. Mm -hmm. They have like a sliding scale of cuts. We can't we can't determine the, uh, what no, they would do with the money anyway because it's a they, bottom line. They may, they handle this. I feel like you know there's more it, there's more interest in talking about the town side. Yep. That's that's, that's why I suggested using our minimum cut for the schools to start and then trying to fill in other places because whatever number we give to the schools. They can do what they want with it. They, they've said that they won't revote it and they're going to stick to that priority list, but they have a bottom line budget. So we're not making line item changes for the schools. Well, did um, uh, the town administrator wanted 80, the school wants 65, right? Is that what we're kind of I saying? I think just to clarify, the town administrator is <coughs> drawing a line in the 80, sand and saying, 20? here's a starting point for us. Okay. Here's a methodology just saying they, they account for 80% of the overage. Mm -hmm. They account for 20% of the overage as a starting point just to let us get talking. So I don't think he's, I don't want to speak for Mr. Denny, but I don't think he's at, definitively advocating it's 80, it's 20. It's like this is a starting point for our discussion. I don't want to mischaracterize. Can we ask him, were you advocating No, that? no, let, can, let's no, keep done. the conversation here. Okay. So the 80-20 um, the was based on the amount of increase over fiscal year 17. Okay. That was Amy's idea. Then we said, okay, we're not going to just accept that cut. Um, let, all right, it was somebody's idea that was presented to us. So we said we're not going to just accept that cut. Let's give each of those two main department areas a range. And so we drew that range on the board. That wasn't okay. Mr. Dennehy's idea. That was the Warren Committee's idea. And I said, does this sound reasonable to folks that we would not cut the schools less than 65 or more than 80? And folks were generally bought into that. And I said, is, do folks generally agree we, we won't cut the town more than X percent and less than X percent? So that's what gave us that overlap zone. Oh, that was your little thing that you put up there, yeah. right? That was like 1-2 to 1-4 or something, if I recall. Go ahead, Brian. So this is just kind of build on what, what Chuck was saying, and I don't know if this is a good place to start, but I'm just trying to get some momentum mm -hmm. here. Why don't we establish some guardrails? Does anyone feel like 65, 35 isn't enough in one direction and 80, 20 isn't far, isn't far enough in the other direction? Like, can we establish some guardrails mm -hmm. and then we can operate within there? Yeah. I think yes. that's a good way to start instead of just trying to hone in on a percent. Mm -hmm. It's just a suggestion. I'm fine with that. I thought that we had done that because I asked almost that exact question and. That's how we came up with the numbers to assign okay. to the departments to cut. That wasn't I. I did not get the sense that. I guess after here. listening to a lot of the impact statements, I don't know about anyone else tonight. It's kind of, it's kind of bringing a lot of things to light as far as like even the fire department. How he said, you know, by the end of the year, the brown on their, you know, lives. So it's making me reassess certain things that we've discussed in the past. So I'm just wondering. You said 65, eight. If maybe I'm personally, I don't know about anyone else, I'm thinking maybe we could start in the middle of those two numbers. You mean 50-50? No, 65 to 80, somewhere come in between and start with that number. It's not the low end, not the high end, in the middle maybe. So you're saying apply a cut to the schools that isn't as low as 987,000 and isn't as high as 1.2 million, but somewhere in the middle of those two numbers? Yes. Richard? So I know we have to start somewhere, and I, I get what you guys are trying to do. 
and I, I think I could, that makes sense to me. However, for me, again, I said this last meeting, um, you know, listening to the impact statements, well, I mean, all of them were detrimental. For me, you hear the fire and the police, and at the 80-20, it sounds like at least the town administrator says that they can do that, 80-20, I believe, not putting words in anybody's mouth. But what it sounds to me like, the increase is detrimental, it and that's public safety. Yes. So for me, I, I would rather us take that out of the equation and say that's going to stay at the 80-20 percent and not the increase and go from there with a the percentage. Just because, I mean, I, I, I get what you're trying to do with the 35 under that You're scenario, still going to have to jump to that at some point. Under that scenario, the minimum cut to the schools would be 1.2 million. I'm just talking about one budget. Yeah. Public safety. Yeah. Okay. Well, police and fire. But then at least that's what I took from today's statements. I mean, you're, you're removing people. You're possibly in July shutting down a fire station. That's a huge issue. Uh, yeah. But then where is it coming from? Are you going to put Hold on, Maggie. Chuck. Time? So I think what he's okay. saying, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Whole public safety to your column D. This is just one way to look at it. Yeah. Hold, hold public safety to your column D. Put everything else into your column E for the town side. And what's the plug for the school? Oh, okay. that, yeah, that, yeah, right on. 109. Yeah, so where does that come from? 357 for the town. That's what that would be. Correct me. 357 this. And again, making is just, I don't want to see trash barrels not removed, but I also don't want to see a fire truck not show up at some of the towns. Richard, that, that would mean a cut, Chuck, of $1,097,058 for the schools. And that is? Yeah, that's approximately it. What percentage of a million? I, I should know, but I, let's do it exactly. <laughs> yeah. Wait, what am I doing wrong? Oops, I didn't need to do a negative. Yes, we should have done that before I last year. Are you figuring the percent for me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Skated along high increases. <clears throat> So that's prioritizing public, public safety. safety. Well, it's it's actually, yeah, it's prioritizing it's all the fire, time. It's, it's, it's holding public safety to the 300,000 cut, right. which is bad but not horrendous. Right. That's my word. At least what I took from it. Right. With this current year. And then keeping the horrendous for everybody else on the town side. And then what does that do? You, you, know, you know what I'm saying. So. Mm -hmm. I'm making this up. This is just one one man's view. Yeah, no, I agree. So then that means that the cuts scenarios that we heard earlier for public works would be implemented in full. Yes. And the library in full. War committee in full. Yeah. Um, 24%. Seven, 76, 24. 76, 24. So, just, I, I'm, I'm open to other ideas. Yeah. Yep. Just throw it up. It's there. a worksheet. It's a yeah. worksheet. Um, I, I'm surprised that you'd be open to cutting, like, consolidated facilities and DPW that much. So, I'm surprised that I'm open to cutting schools 74%. Yeah. I'd rather be at 65 but I'm trying to, I thought that was compelling testimony mm -hmm. tonight. Yeah, me too. So if DBW had brought out all of their workers and folks yeah, who right. use the no, parks. That's oh, I don't care about that. Yeah. I'm just saying public safety is, a, <laughs> you know, that's a. Rip, uh, yeah, Rich. So, so my thinking behind this is surely just looking at a safety thing, right? So mm -hmm. it's putting public safety, police, fire, you know, again, do I, consolidated facilities, I mean, in the last five years, we've mm -hmm. been saying we need to up it, we need to up it. So I do not want to see them lose anything because a cut there, I agree, loses other money. Yeah. But this is kind of like a, a public safety thing. This is, a, in my opinion, a bare bone of, of the worst case scenario. Uh, yeah, I, and I'll if I, I, yes. I just think eighty percent for schools is too much. Agreed. Period. I think seventy six percent is. Yeah, too much. you know. So I'm. I, I, what do you What do you do? I think we need to lower it. 
I mean, I mean, I think this presentation tonight with everybody's involvement was terrible. It was painful. It hurt. We need an override. I mean, and so I don't want to. I don't want to balance the non-contingent budget on so much on the school side. You know, I always say that. But but you're not you're board. not what? making an alternative suggestion. Sixty-five, thirty-five. Right? And w but where do the cuts go? Oh, we haven't been. Where they were laid Back out to today. public safety. What they your, said to you're calling me. The patch of what? The, the, you're talking about I'm the, doing. Yeah. I think 6535 is more reasonable. I don't think it's fair, but it's a little less disproportionate. So then you would take another hundred thousand dollars from public safety, which would be the difference, and you would feel comfortable <laughs> that if the override failed or the town meeting didn't pass the contingent budget, you'd feel comfortable with the level of safety in the town that we would then have to live with under the non-contingent scenario? No, but I would also feel like we can't hurt the schools in that way if, Why? The, if the contingent. We have to hurt somebody. I know it. Well, I think that, I think we need to be a united town so that we can pass an override. And I think when the cuts are more evenly distributed across the town departments we look more successful in sending the message that the town need these positions the town needs these services the town needs to increase these services and the budget so that we can be made whole i think i had richard and then brian yeah it, and i agree my only issue is we only cut we only re, in this scenario you're only keeping um whole or not whole in this scenario one Two departments, which means everybody else is taking that increase. Mm -hmm. So it, it's not even, it's, it's very hard to get to that number. Right. So, my issue and the reason why I bring up the police and the fire is for the sheer fact that um, the fire department is saying with the increase, it's June, July that they're shutting down departments. That's, I mean, that's, that's, that's tough to hear. Um, police is saying literally they're taking people off the road. I mean, again, and you don't have to agree with me, but my thought is when you're in a a nasty scenario like this. Public safety. Could we do just well, do the percentages? I had um, Brian next, and then I'll come yeah. to you. I'm just say one thing. I'm at least intentionally trying to do is to make sure I'm not making decisions on this and how it positions an override. That is not. I don't want to spread it out across the town because it's going to promote an override better. That's not how I'm looking at this. I'm looking at this like let's look at a non-contingent budget. Let's do what's what we all believe just frankly sucks. But let's do. Yeah what we think is right regardless of how it positions an override down the road because I think that's, for me, it's an independent discussion and I'm trying to, I mean, it's not independent, I understand that, but I'm trying not to make a decision here on how it gets positioned to the rest of the town for an override. Yeah, yes. we have to do what's right for the town overall. Um, so to your point about percentages and doing yeah, well, what's right for the town. Can we play around with that? I'm, I'm not going to play around with percentages. If okay. folks want to grab their calculators and start doing percentages, I want to talk about prioritizing cuts, not, mm -hmm. not yeah. draconian numbers. Right. Well, it's just a way to get to. It's just a way to get to. I think we've done it, though. We have a range. We established a range. We all bought into it. We gave it to the departments to stay within, and we have a high and a low for schools and non-schools. Yeah, but what, what they... What, I think what you were saying was, um, if we move that percentage over, where does that put the schools? Right. Right there. I mean, it's what? What was it? Seventy. Seventy-six. 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 Um, yeah. Jonathan, I think it's it's instead of thinking about percentages in terms of the town mm -hmm. and school, it's quite you know the the difference is a hundred. It will mean a hundred eight thousand dollars if we hold police and fire at the first round of cuts and don't apply any, you know, don't change it from the original 2080, you're talking about $108,000 out of the schools. Mm. So that is when you consider that the, when you consider that much of the increase is attributable to SPAD, which I, under, I, I consider in, a, in essence a contractual obligation. You're talking about, and when you remember that SPED is already approximately 25% of the school budget, you know, we've, we've seen analogies to this sort of thinking before, you know, this, this sort of thinking before in the other departments. That means you're applying the cut 
to only 75, you know, the entire cut that we're talking about in the schools, you're applying that entirely to general education. Take SPED off the, take SPED off the table. So, I, I, you know, the bottom line is we don't have any good choices. I don't know that I can justify any of these. Um, I'm leery, though, about I'm trying to it's sort of holding harmless any of the departments from, from some of the cuts that we're talking about. Because it's going to be brutal no matter where you are. And I am reluctant to prioritize any particular department over, over another. Um, I'm sensitive. I understand your concern about public safety, but I consider the schools equally important. So no good choices. No good choices. And, and we can... Uh, we're not, nobody is going to come out of this discussion feeling good about the results that come up. Yes, Michael. Yeah, I, th I want to second what Jonathan said about SPED being a, a, a real budget buster. I think the schools operate under a different set of rules than the town side did. Jonathan made this point to me a couple weeks ago, how these are, it's like a bill, you know, they got this. Linda Lee says it's $650,000. I was furiously trying to add things up. I came up with more than 19,000. But there's some number that's out there that's like 25% of their budget that they just, you know, we can't decide that. That's been decided already by the state. That money's going for SPED. So. Richard? Or right, if you're not done. So, um, you know, I think that, it, Public safety does resonate with me. I mean, I don't want to see people dying, you know, in fires, and I don't want to see people, you know, having a, a riot break out and no, no, not enough police to con control it. But, you know, I think that we can make some calls. Like, I don't mind them not cutting the grass in the park. It's like, if that's what's going to happen, we're, I don't mind them not taking out the trash in downtown East Milton. Right. Fine, you know. That's not going to hurt anybody. Well, well that's, that's the choice our voters made when they said, no override, you know, live with this non-contingent budget, which is kind of an exercise in, like, futility, really, you know? It, it's so um, I'm, I'm leaning to, I, you know, I don't know what the percentages are, but I think that this, this number of 419000 or $650,000 kind of brings you in the neighborhood of that million ninety-seven that we're hitting the schools up with. I have Richard and then Gene. Sorry. No, I just was going to make a I, I agree. I mean, I think we're all kind of saying we, to start with, we agree. It's bad. Um, but remember, the proposal that I put on there, it's 110 grand. So if you just take the 110,000 out, you're fine. You're putting 110,000 back to the schools. What my thought was is $110,000 literally means closures of things or possibly putting you in, in harm. I know it hurts the schools. So if it's 1.09 or 1.19, I don't know what that extra 100,000 does to the schools, but it sure looks like it. Two teachers. Two teachers. Two teachers. Two teachers. Yeah. It doesn't shut a school Four down. Four aides. Um, yeah, no, I, 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 I'm not, it's very hard to balance these interests off against each other. And, you know, we're looking at sort of an exercise in municipal self-destruction if we don't, if we don't get an override through. Um, but there is no guarantee of getting an override. And, and I do feel the schools have made an enormous amount of progress. I saw it, my, my daughter's now out. Um, it got better year by year. And I'd hate to see that sort of progress uh, put at risk. And, and I would also suggest we recall <laughs> the rather staggering demographic statistics that were shared with us, the growth in schools. I mean, we're now, we will be next, as of next year, we'll be out of space for new kindergarten classes. So we're in a position where we're sort of digging a ditch for ourselves and, and you know, everybody's going to be in it to one extent or another. Yes? Yeah, acknowledging progress in the schools, I get it, but maybe people who have been on this committee longer than I can articulate, how long has it, this progress been sort of on the backs of all the other departments? Okay. If, yeah. if, if, you, if, you took, if you put, excuse me, this growth in special education is required 
So now you just have to afford, you know, it's in, no, no questions asked. Budget's got to go up, other budget's got to come down. Like, is there a pattern of mm. progress on the backs of other departments? Because at some point, you're not acting like who you are. There's, there's no question that when you don't have an override, yeah. the recent history is that the schools increase year over year much more than the non-school departments. So every year that you don't have an override, resources shift from the non-school departments to the school departments. That's just the way the numbers work up. And my reaction to that is you're progressing towards you're not who you are. I'm sorry. Like you're, you're not who you are. You're just... This is going up, this is going down, you're not being realistic. You know, maybe our class sizes are what they are because other departments keep shrinking without an override. Or maybe, yeah. Yeah, I'm not quite. I'll come to you, Richard. Just you con I mean, yeah. Again, I, I know I don't need to say this, but so, I mean, I've got two kids in the schools. I mean, believe me, if the schools get hit with one point, whatever, I'm still going to be. Wanting to give, wanting them to give them the same education as they got last year. I mean, you know, just like everybody else. But I can't wait till we talk about contingent budget. This is again worst mm -hmm. case. We know it might not pass, yeah. so we might be stuck with this. Again, that was just my principles of safety first. If you don't mm -hmm. have to, you don't have to agree. But again, it's only 110 grand. It's not adding a whole lot. Somebody else needs to make a much better, bigger pitch if you want to really affect the schools. I mean, Jean, you had something? Yeah, I just want to, right when we throw this unfunded mandates around, because there is, there is, an, there is a, a dollar amount attached to SPED, but there also is an unfunded mandate to keep houses from burning down. It may not be in a contract, okay? But it's an unfunded mandate. We are not funding these things mm -hmm. for the police department, for the, for the fire department. And, and I, Bill Ritchie does have the figures. For every dollar we cut from his bu budget, you can add probably 10 on to uh, an override. I mean, not an override, a reserve fund transfer. Because those are dangerous things that he's working with, whether it's lighting public areas, whether it's um, everything that Bill Ritchie does, electrical, et cetera. So I think that just because it doesn't say unfunded mandate, there's unfunded mandate right throughout the town, and you have to start recognizing it. Just because it isn't a contract, a bill someone's handing you, it costs. It's going to cost you. Pay me now, pay me later. It's going to cost you. Jonathan, I cut you off. Oh, that's quite all right. Thank you. Um, OK. Anybody else? Or there has to be somebody else, because we have to keep talking. <laughs> Um, I, I, could, I could walk you through, if you wanted to, this long cut list. And the, the impact of what was proposed by Richard and I think Chuck was that um, public safety would take an $85,000 um, cut for police and youth. Fire would take a $57,000 cut for overtime staffing, which brings them uh, overtime unfunded to $117,000. Um, fire would also, nope, that's it. So then, then we start looking at the ones and twos for every other department. So general government, <coughs> veterans, no impact on that 10,000, and board of assessors, no impact on that 10,000. But now information technology, $12,500 $12, in deferred replacement of equipment, council on aging, um, which they haven't exactly agreed to accept, but um, $3,538 reduction to fuel, oil, and gas. And then all of the cuts to DPW, which include elimination of the entire tree planting program, curtailing rodent control, replacement of barrels, closing the recycle center every other month, eliminating Sunday barrel recycling, eliminating the collection of anything that has a tank, including TVs and other things with Freon. Um, Compromised ability to pay for emergencies may, may be requiring reserve fund transfers. Elimination of severe weather responsibility may be requiring reserve fund transfers. Elimination of the youth summer employment program. Repairs, uh, elimination of the repairs to police vehicles, um, et cetera, on Sundays. Um, and uh, Excuse me, on Saturdays, which may require reserve fund transfers. And then all other fleet maintenance then has to be done Monday to Friday. For the Board of Health, 
$2,733 to be determined how that would be implemented. Um, and then for the library, elimination of summer Saturdays or AD operating hours, reduction in electricity, reduction in materials, and elimination of a part-time library assistant. For the cemetery, $10,000 maintenance reduction, which will impact tree work and other equipment. And then an $8,000 reduction in overtime, which may cause them to close for funerals on Saturdays. Um, parks and Rec, uh, yet to be determined exactly, but $6,000 from seasonal overtime on the low end, $5,000 since we gave them the full impact, total of $11,203. Um, the schools we discussed on the previous page, and then consolidated facilities would receive all these cuts, um, which we just went through. So $25,000 for overtime, uh, sorry, $2,500 for emergency overtime, which would result in deferred maintenance, $11,000, which would result in deferred maintenance, $5,000 seasonal help, uh, which would result in deferred maintenance, and then $1,500 uh, to the postage meetings and office supplies lines spread out through those three. Yep. Just a quick question. I can't read it from here, but what was the technology one that you mentioned? It's a software. software. He's not going to it, That one isn't the software, I don't oh, think. No, uh, that uh, that technology so. one is he, replacing of equipment that's aged out. So why couldn't that be the one time in one time phone? Um, well, because you plan, you, I mean, you have a every year. you have a cycle of what your equipment is, and you know what its useful life is, and when you're going to replace it. So that's a that's a planned replacement program. It would be hard to believe that that was a um, un you know sure. expected scenario. Sorry, can you remind me again the priorities? Does a, a one is a top level priority of things to cut first? The ones and the twos are, correspond to what the town administrator suggested cuts were. So under his first scenario, he submitted $300,000 in cuts. So he essentially then prioritized, if you're going to cut 300000 cut them from these areas. Those have a one. Then we asked him, you have to go back and oh, give us true. cuts up to 525000 So anything that has a two is included in that additional round of cuts. So if you're going to implement all cuts for a department, it's the ones and the twos. And they add up. They're not um, duplicative. So the budget is balanced. The schools take a $1,097,058 cut. The um, public safety sustains cuts at the um, lower end of the spectrum, which I believe we heard are hurtful but acceptable. And all of the other departments accept the higher end cut. This is where you talk. <laughs> well, maybe we could just go down the list and maybe we can agree on the ones we feel that we can definitely cut. Like an example, maybe we don't need to um, have DPW yard open. I think it was one of these line items. Or Saturday, uh, the library, even though we don't want to, as opposed to some of the more important things. Maybe we could start weeding out the ones that we feel that we all are in agree agreement with that we definitely could cut. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's, that's easier. It, it sounds like a great idea not to be a stick in the mud, but the, the problem with that is if you say you want to save anything else, it's either got to come out of the schools or come out of public safety. I mean, there's no other place to put it. If um, there's some cut that you find unacceptable, say to the library or something, wh where are you going to replace that cut? That's it. Schools. I mean, or public safety. Or public safety. Right. Amy, would you like to come to the table? I would just come to like the table, to say please. Something yeah. that I think might um, be found helpful. Some money. Yeah. Right. No, I didn't find any money, <laughs> yeah. but it might just might be helpful. So, in the schools, non-contingent request of two point nine, I believe there's six hundred and fifty thousand of sped that keeps being discussed. So if you first say 650000 will be funded because that's contractual, and then you look at the remaining difference, so the three, three million five ninety nine two twenty less the 650 is $2.9 million. And then you re, I know you don't like talking about percentages, mm -hmm. but you now look at the, the 700000 on the town is now 24% of the 2.9.
and the schools are 75%, you're somewhere in the ballpark of where you guys are now, 1.1, 400,000 on the town. Just a, another thing to think about, another the think reasonableness. About, another way to think about it. What that ultimately does is it funds the SPED of right. 650, mm -hmm. and then of the 525 in contractual wage adjustments for the town, it will fund 60 one percent of that and of the schools 1.8 million of wage adjustments contractual obligations that will fund 60 percent of that that's about even just something to think about i exactly again where. nobody right. wants to think percentages but i keep hearing that yeah. it's sped 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 so let's consider taking sped out yeah there's 650 and then look at what's left yeah. mm -hmm. what what the asks are that's left and then maybe the percentages maybe the asks are more comparable mm -hmm. okay so maybe that 80 20 without the sped maybe that is now a little bit more i don't even want to say palatable because right. i don't think mm -hmm. on any side it's a yeah. good scenario so, so okay. just okay. something i just wanted but without the sped say, say that percentages again it's about, it's, about what it's, it's about what you are. It's yeah. 24.3 and 75.7. So call it 25, 75. Yep. And you're in the ballpark, yeah. just as a reasonableness test. Right, so thanks. I just wanted to offer that up because I thought it might yep. be another way to look at it. Thanks, Amy. Thank you. Can I ask Glenn to comment on that since sure. she's here? Glenn, do you want to join us? Can you comment on Amy's suggestion? I think she did. Yeah. <laughs> he says he thinks she did their numbers right. Okay. Um, yeah, that's a good starting point. Does that mean? That's a good answer. Yeah. It's not. It's not all the way to the top of what the schools right. prepared in cuts of 1.2, but you know, it's basically saving the higher end cuts from public safety mm. and removing those from the schools. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anyone else? Good. Yeah. Find some more money to add to the schools. What are the final numbers on what? I think it's pretty much, it's pretty much the same as it's column what's, F. It's, yeah. Is this Chuck's suggestion? It is column F, I think. It's column F. Yeah. It's just, I think what Amy was saying was just a way to think about it. Yeah, she, yeah. Was, she was applying a percentage to it for us yeah. without spend. Yeah. 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 A symmetry to it. Yeah. Just so you get the same. Beautiful. Column F. Column F is the Warrant Committee cuts. Okay. And so those are right now totaling $1.5 million. And since folks were leaning on the 80 20 or 65, whatever earlier, Amy just pulled the SPED number out of the schools and said, if we stick with the cuts that are in column F, that essentially means the schools are absorbing 75% of the cuts and the towns absorb, the non school departments are absorbing 24. I'm good with that. Well, I'm not good with it, but I, I don't know that we can right. get too much better. <laughs> well, no, I mean, yeah, yeah exactly. Right. I know we haven't heard from Blue Hills Regional yet. Is that number? It's a bill. It's yeah. a bill? It's a pretty firm number. Mm. It's a bill? No, it it's is a bill. A bill. What did you say, Jonathan? It's a bill. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's it. So how far, did you, how far are we going with this tonight? We can vote it if if folks are ready, or we can leave it until Wednesday. I'd prefer to, I'd prefer to shift our focus as soon as possible to talking about the contingent budget and how we get that passed and what it can do for our town. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. Ms. Jim? Make a, I yes. Uh, I told you when I came tonight that, that until I was sworn in, I wouldn't speak. Yes, Bill? Vote on these issues. OK. So I would very much like to put this off until Wednesday That's so that I can discuss it and talk about it and make my opinion known to the committee. OK. I think that's why I'm supposed to be here. Yep. Should we take a vote on that? <laughs> you should weigh in. Are you okay with delaying until Wednesday? Let's talk about the schedule for Wednesday for a minute. It's not great. Does Mr. Matthews not feel comfortable weighing in at this point, or is it just... Well, he's not sworn in yet. I tell him I should be sworn in by the town clerk, which okay. obviously couldn't be done tonight. I, I, don't, I don't think that there is a... Good to see he, Phil can't vote tonight, but he, he could speak. There's nothing. Yeah. I mean, we let people from the town speak. Right. If you wanted to share your opinion, you're welcome to share it at yeah. this point. I'd rather wait until later. Okay. Yes? I was saying the interest of expedience so you can defer the vote. But what the discussion? 
deferring a vote, but have mm -hmm. the discussion. It would be right. Splitting the baby and probably a lot more priority. Okay, I would agree. Speak up, Phil. <laughs> I'm sorry. They want you to talk. They want you to talk. Yeah. <laughs> but okay. we'll we'll hold the vote for. Yeah. We'll hold the vote for Wednesday. So we um, can think about it. I have to say that I'm um, somewhat surprised by the entire process that's being used to come up with the cuts for this non-contingent budget. Um, it has not been done and is not being done in the way any override budget that this town has ever passed. Um, we have passed, fortunately, as many as many people think, but we've passed a number of them. Um, those override, but those non-contingent budgets and override years were always looked at in terms of who was bearing the brunt of the costs of service cuts. And those service cuts were always viewed as primarily cuts to staff, because that's usually the only way you can get to cutting a, a large deficit uh, in a budget the size that we have. And those cuts have always been spread across schools and town budgets. And primarily they've been cut spread across schools, public service, public safety, and DPW. And if you look back at the proposed cuts that were going to be implemented under all of the past non-contingent budgets, you would see cuts not only in schools, but you would see personnel cuts in fire, you would see personnel cuts in police, and you would see personnel cuts in DPW. And no warrant committee was ever accused in those times of putting public safety in the town of Milton in danger. And I think that for us to let that percolate and be accepted by people who might be listening to us is really a very bad idea, because I just don't think that that's true. Um, what you're looking at now, based on what we heard tonight, and the numbers are not too dissimilar from what the school has already presented, staff cuts. And on the town side, we're looking at two fire cuts and a part-time library cut. There are some other bad cuts that are going to limit services to, to residents, um, but they're not personnel cuts. And I think that to put forth a budget like that and then to go out and ask for people to vote on an override is going to be very badly received. Um, and I think it's terribly unfair to the schools and to the students who get an education in this town. Richard? So my question, and I feel I, I respect you a great deal. I mean, you've been on here a while, and um, you know that. I mean, I do. You need to clarify, you need to expound on that, I think, because so from where I sit and listening to these budgets over the last several months, I'm hearing what the police say that they're going to cut. I'm hearing what the fire's going to I heard what everybody's going to cut. So you, you can't say that they're not losing people and losing hours and, you know, they're the expert in running that department, say the fire department. So I've got to take the fire chief at his word when he says, if we go with the 80-20 at 57-7-14, um, end of the year, we're probably going to go into brownouts. Well, in my, my thought is I'm hoping we have money there for a reserve fund transfer. The problem is, is that 109000 I mean, that stuff is more immediate. And it seems to be, if you look at their budget, how are you going to... So the comment about the schools, I totally agree. I don't want to see them take a million-dollar cut. Problem though is, is if you want it to be a five hundred thousand dollar cut, who's taking the other five hundred thousand? You can't put. Who's taking what? Who's taking that extra money? You know what I mean. So if you came up with and said, "I want the schools to take half of what they're gonna," or they should only do fifty percent, you've got to find a place to put that money. And I think at least the last hour we've been asking, mm -hmm. does anybody have an opinion on where that money can go? I haven't heard anything because if somebody came up with a great idea, I'm on board. Um, I just don't see it. So I, I agree with your comments, but yeah. you've got to actually point to some places you put the money. Point to some places to put money? To, to take, cuts. to make cuts. There's cuts. It's a 1.5 million in cuts. We've so you got, have to have cuts. We have the cuts already been provided to us by the town side and the school side. It's just a question of which set of cuts you want to take. Right. And it looks like what so we, we did is at least money. put together a mix. Which level of cuts do you want? Right. Now, we've had, the cuts that we've had in the past to public safety have also been devastating. Right. And they were part of the very important reasons why this town got together and every override we've ever run, 
on an operational basis in support of them. Because they knew there were going to be real cuts in all the major departments, the departments that have all the money. We, we, usually we've never reached down mm -hmm. into library. It's got to still have to come from somewhere. Right sounds like what you're saying is you have to put the town at serious risk in order to help make sure that the contingent budget passes. Overrides have always been about serious risk. Every override we've ever had. I don't understand why the Warren Committee's fiscal responsibility wouldn't be to minimize the risk to the town. I agree. How are you minimizing the risk would you put most of the By not firing in? police and firemen or reducing their overtime to the point where you have four cars on the road in a town our size at any given time. We've, mm -hmm. had, we've, had, we've had reserve fund transfers on overtime over and above the last year. Now you're banking on it. Yeah. 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 Well, I understand. This I, is I, worst I, case scenario. Um, yeah. I have Brian and then you two. Right. No, I was just going to say, I, I guess that, so basically what I was saying earlier is that runs counter to what we should be doing, you're basically saying, is to position the override better and amortize the cuts over the, over the town, whereas I seem to align with Lee Michael, which is, in the event an override doesn't pass, which is extremely challenging, I want to minimize the damage. So mm -hmm. I'm... Just because it's ever, you know, what I'm aligned with Richard and Chuck. Mm -hmm. I don't want our public safety departments there in dire straits right now and not comfortable with it. And it has nothing to do with the theatrics that we saw here tonight because I felt the same way after the schools came in here. I said, oh, this is just never, this is terrible. And so it's, it, it's spread even, mm -hmm. it's spread evenly, evenly across. I just, it makes me uncomfortable to think that we have to spread the pain across the town to make the override. I mean, a lot has changed since the last over. It was eight years ago. A lot has changed. And he's got how many unfunded positions do they have? I have Chuck and Michael, and then I'll come to you. Chuck. Yeah. Rightly or wrongly, I think it's an accepted practice to lay teachers off. That just kind of happens in towns, is my understanding. I think it's more rare in like you know cops and firefighters. Maybe not. Because I don't go back, not to be disparaging, I don't go as far back as you do. So, but that, that is just kind of my sense. It's just a, a little bit more customary to lay off, you know, that everyone gets the pink slip and they move all around. Doesn't make it right. That's just, I think, more customary. Um, and two, you know, I, I think there's a good chance the override doesn't pass. So that's my, mm, yeah, my right. mindset. And so... I, I would rather go 65 35 it is I mean I the, but as as someone who's trying to look out for the best interest of the town I think it's in the best interest of the town to, <clears throat> to cut police and fire but not and that's going to be positions even though maybe through the overtime just not to be as dramatic I don't know I thought it was pretty compelling um, the testimony we heard mm -hmm. today that, those are that, those are kind of, that's just my logic Michael Mark then Richard Michael yeah if you put up your Warrant Committee non-contingent budget worksheet again, please. Mm -hmm. So it looks like what, I just checked this out with Richard too. It's like what we're talking about here is that we are suggesting that we're gonna take all the cuts that are under TA suggested cuts two, except for the ones that say public safety, yep. which we're gonna take TA suggested cuts one. Right. Yeah. And so we're talking about $109,000 difference between Yep. Right. 109 that's, five, five, that's, five. that's really what we're at, where we're at right yep. now. But I don't know if Phil was suggesting we actually go further than that. No, well, my point was you, you talked about keeping the, you, about protecting public service right in this new budget. So the fear and the pain that you just said you thought was apparent in the presentation was if it was before you made that change. I'm sorry? Now you're talking about going to 75 percent. You're talking about putting $100,000 back in public safety. Oh, but I think there's still fear. Yeah. I think there's still pain, even in the, the yeah, 300,000. The, yeah. the, um, yeah. uh, the column D. I think I, my vision that back. Okay, I have uh, Mark, and then. Yeah. So I mean, I don't really want to get into a trade-off between the schools and the police and fire. I think that it's um, just it, it, in. Any way you cut it, you're going to, you know, get people's emotions rising, one side or the other. I, I think with regards to public safety, and the thing that's being overlooked here is that public safety is an incredible benefit to our teachers and our students. We have the first priority to everybody entering those school buildings on a daily basis is that they are safe mm -hmm. before they learn. Band, 
before they learn, you know, art, whatever it might be, the first thing, the first duty we have is that they're safe. And trust me, I, I, I'm the son of a school teacher. I have uh, a daughter going into kindergarten next year. I have two others behind her. I'm aware of, you know, the strain that that's going to put on the school system. I moved to Milton for the school system. I'm one of those people. But if my daughter is going to school, I want to know that she's safe. And if she's not safe and I don't feel comfortable with that, I would, I would leave this town. So just, just something to consider that maybe you think of public safety also as a benefit for the schools. Richard and then Betty? Yeah, just to clarify, and I know this might not have been where you were going, but I didn't come up with this. This wasn't my thought today. When we were originally talking about the 80-20, I knew that we were going back and asking for the increased cuts. And we have already heard for a long time now from the police and the fire what the 80-20 did to them. And so I knew that you, you knew the impacts were going to be big, right? And again, I'm relying on the department heads and the, town, the new town administrator to tell us what each of these cuts is going to do to them, like the schools is doing. My thing, that, or I guess what I'm trying to say, and again, I floated this as an, at least the safety as an idea, but to Michael's point, you're talking $109,000. To make it more fair, to like Betty's point, you need to go way beyond public safety. You're going to have to go through every one of those departments into the DPW's nightmare story that they said today and say double it. You're going to have to go to the. You're going to have to just jack every one of those up to get to a more <laughs> fair position. I just haven't heard anybody float that. Um, you mean to fund 109 added back in? Um, to keep. So in my. So for me, I would say leave the 109 there. But let's say, say you put 109 back. Now you're at 820. Now you're at the. Uh, what was it? 60, 40, or 65, 35. 65, 35. Now what? Your the schools are still bearing the massive run. Now you need to go beyond that. And where? Um, I'm going to come back to Phil in just a second. Betty? I just wanted to comment on Mark's comments about keeping your children safe in school. And, you know, yes, occasionally. And our teachers. Occasionally, people, I mean, police officers and fire department officials come into the schools when there's an issue. But the people that keep the kids safe are the teachers. I mean, that's the bottom line. We're there every day, eight hours a day with those kids, and we're the ones that keep them safe. But they can't get to school if then it's not safety on the streets, if, if there's crime going on and, and you don't have the I have a question for Phil. <clears throat> um, Phil, you were a little critical when you started speaking about the, the process of how the cuts were yeah. identified. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you had a different suggestion other than us going to the departments and asking them to provide us their cuts. No, I think you should go to the departments and their, their feedback on what they would cut is absolutely crucial. But I think rather than using percentages or formulas mm -hmm. or numbers in and of themselves, you need to look at what the effect is going to be. Mm -hmm. And the effect is going to be on services to people who want these services. And they're going to be spread however you spread them. And the approach has always been to spread those cuts and services across the town budgets and the school budgets, not just so heavily on one budget. So then the minimum that, before you joined, the minimum cut that the Warren Committee had determined was reasonable for the schools to accept was $987,503. Would you advocate for reduce? Is that the 65% yeah. or is that a different number? It's the 65. And that would require? Even though you don't want to talk about percentages, yes. <laughs> yeah, right. The, oh, how we got there? Right, yes, that was how we set up those highs and low cuts. I wouldn't be able to give you an answer to that until I sat down and I said, I want to see what the cuts are. Mm. And I want to list them out and look at them. For the schools, you mean? Okay. So in terms, of, in terms of the impact, I will forward this spreadsheet to you, but everybody else got this spreadsheet this morning. It's everything that's listed on this page except for this number two next to public safety for police and fire. And it's everything on this page from the school committee down to, if you add the numbers up, down to a total of $1,097,000, which gets you somewhere in this bottom box around future problem solving, I think. Does that differ from what's in this? These, the school committee cuts are not. Right, the town ones will be the same as the school committee? Yeah. 
I based the spreadsheet that I sent this morning off of getting that from Amy, so it should be the same. Yeah, Tom, do you want to come to the table? Yeah, just, just one quick comment. And it's, it's probably somewhat rehashing a little bit of, of what was said before, but, um, but you know, keep in mind that you know, for the past 10 years, the town side has been putting in uh, many of those years level dollar budgets, more recently level dollar plus contractuals, while the schools have been putting in level service budgets. Not getting fully funded for those budgets, but you're right, there has been a push from town side to school side in terms of the allocation of dollars. We're down to critical mass right now. I mean, the, the smallest cut to police and fire are cuts. I mean, you, you, you heard you heard the police chief say that, you know, even though we, we have a, um, a six, um, uh, you know, six sectors, we're only funding right now with five, five, five patrols. Um, and, and, you know, the, the fire department is one bad injury away from, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it's, it is bad on the town side. It is bad. You know, the, the, even the 80-20 the, the cuts to, to the fire department and the police department are real cuts. They, they are real, those are real people on the street. I think everybody believes that on this committee, but some people are saying that the w override will have a better chance of but passing. But we shouldn't be if the thinking cuts about sound override worse. right now. We should be thinking about what if you have to live with right. this budget? Yeah, I agree. Is this the one you want to live with? No. Can you live with it? Right. That's what you have to think about right now. Yeah. Yes, sir. Can I ask you a um, Thanks, Tom. So you mentioned the 80-20 on the police and the fire. I mean, is it? Oh, he thought you were. Well, sorry. Sorry. I mean, yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, I just, yeah, I don't, as long as you, you don't mind, I just want your opinion on the 80-20 for the, 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 police, the public safety. I mean, is this type of scenario? I mean, no, yeah, nobody, I, nobody wants to see any hits to public safety. Nobody wants to see teachers laid off either. I mean, uh, it kind of is what it is. I mean, you're going to have to you know, we'll all have to suck it up and, and, and do the best we can with it. I think certainly the 80-20 the is more fair than 65-35 with, with respect to the police and fire. Um, I mean, you know, at least on the fire side, if everything goes well. well that is the 80-20. Yeah, that's, that's the 80-20, yeah. For um, public safety. Yeah, on, 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 on the, yeah if, if we leave it at the 80-20, at least on, on, on the fire side, if everything goes well, there may be some brownouts near the end of the year, but you know we're not talking about closing a, a fire station, but virtually the whole year, which we could easily be doing on the on the other one. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have one other bad injury, or you know, you, you got a couple of people out for an extended period of time, and you got no overtime budget, because you virtually have no overtime budget. Right. So be careful what you wish for. Yeah. You have something else? Well, no. My comment is, I think that's that. I don't think you have to make a special case right. for an override. I think the case is still there. Yeah. Sure, yeah. Just absolutely. You know, it, absolutely. I agree with Tom. Huh? We should be voting. Well, I thought yes. we said we're, we're not going to vote tonight. No, not now. But maybe we should just break. No one break. Maybe we just move on to the schedule. And, okay. And then we can. Yeah. We can come back to this in a minute if if somebody well, has I, a brainstorm. I, I, just, I just I thought we were going to hit the, hit this vote. We'll let everyone sleep on it. Hopefully, no, we'll have fewer guests and we can vote on Wednesday. No, I wasn't talking about <coughs> voting, but I agree with okay. him as far as um, thinking about not what's the best scenario for an override. We should be doing the best for what's good for the town now, and can we live with it if we don't get the override? I agree. All right, so here's the current schedule. We're going to be back here on Wednesday night, which is March 1st. We're going to go through the planning board budget and only one planning board article as discussed in the email that I sent out, but this is news to some people in town, we're only gonna go over the medical marijuana article on Wednesday, March 1st. We're also gonna go over the town government study committee articles. There are two of them. Um, one is the procurement officer and the other is um, <clears throat> suggested changes to the personnel board responsibilities, et cetera. I had a discussion today with Rick Neely and <clears throat> you all saw the email that we received from the personnel board. Mm -hmm. And I told Rick I had some concerns that 
they appeared to be as far apart as they were in that email, given the timing that we have, and that we are now much less than 48 hours from the meeting on Wednesday night, and we have not read their proposed changes to the personnel board. It doesn't seem like we have enough time to process through to ask appropriate questions on Wednesday. And so he suggested maybe postponing it for up to two weeks, just the, just the personnel board one, not the um, chief procurement officer. And I said, I didn't, I, I said, okay, but we have the warrant is due to the printer in final draft on March 22nd, unless we get a few days out of them. I don't know if we can or not, but if the schedule is the schedule, the final draft is due to them on the 22nd, which means the first draft is due to them like a week before that. So <clears throat> I think we're out of time if we're waiting two weeks on that second town government study committee article. And, and I suggested maybe that needs to be postponed to the fall. Um, given where we are with having read any part of it or none of it <clears throat> and and the reaction that I saw from the from the personnel board so there is a town government study committee meeting tomorrow night Rick Neely is going to bring it up at the meeting and they're going to process through it and and talk about what it is they want to recommend to the Warren committee to do with that article um, on Wednesday night we'll spend the bulk of our time having a contingent budget discussion with Michael um, and Amy, I assume, poor Amy. And then um, we did receive a request today. I mean, I got many, many phone calls today and requests for people to speak, but we got one for Wednesday already from a parent um, who's on the Special Education Committee in Milton, CPAC, uh, to come in and talk about the effects, not only in the non-contingent budget, she wanted to address contingent budget issues for the, for the school budget and impacts on the SPED program. So I ask you, do you want to do that, or do you think we should ask her to submit a written statement? Written. Jonathan? Yeah. I was actually going to bring this up before we adjourned. I'll be very quick. Can we talk at some point when we've got the, uh, the town meeting behind us about setting rules yeah. for taking testimony from? <coughs> for what, Jonathan? I've, Taking testimony. Yeah, taking testimony. Yeah. Taking away testimony. You know, ta allowing people to address us. I'm not expressing an opinion one way or another. I just would like to see rules. Yeah. Whatever they may be, you know, we can determine. But um, I think we've done it on a sort of ad hoc basis. And we could have an early April discussion about that. Yeah, I'm not. After the warrant goes to the printer. Yeah. But I, I wonder if any decision we make, maybe it's advice to a future warrant committee, but we can't bind to them, you know, yeah. but it could be advice. Whatever, 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 just so we've had a discussion and we can set expectations at the very least. Yeah, okay. Public meetings, so you may have no choice. Okay. Okay. You I don't, I don't have to recognize, I don't have to recognize anybody no. uh, from what I read, but it, it doesn't I'm seem. Sure well, the meeting affects. The, yeah, it's worth checking. It is worth checking. The charge of the Warren Committee, as I've read it, is for us to make ourselves smart about all of the things that impact the things that we're discussing. And everybody that spoke tonight clearly had. I mean, having the Collicott PTO president and former school committee members, it seems reasonable that they have knowledge that we might want to have, given how little we know about running a school district. So it, it seemed to pass the the test to me. But I don't mean to, I'm I don't mean happy. to suggest any criticism. I don't either. think you're not. I don't yeah, think you're I mean, not. I just, I just, it's fine. I think expert, I'm happy know, to have the conversation. Dealing with the expectations yep. of people. Okay, okay, so that's the March 1st meeting. I will then, on your recommendation, ask her to submit some written testimony. Yeah. yeah. Chuck? Yes. Only because Time we're going to have to start with this vote. It's not that no disrespect for mm -hmm. her or special right. education or anything. It's just that we're on, yeah. we're getting under a time right. crunch. I yeah. agree. Really. Okay. We will then meet on Monday the 6th to have this conversation about the contingent budget and try to build that. And hopefully we won't have 50 plus people show up at that meeting and we will process through it a little bit faster. Um, and we will on that evening also, we'll probably start with the other two planning board articles. So that is going to take some time. That's going to be a tight meeting because we're going to replace basically what we did with testimony at the beginning part of this meeting with um, testimony from the planning board. And we already have requests from abutters who want to come in and talk to us about Ice House and Carberry. So that's not going to be a slam dunk that we'll get through the contingent budget that night. 
We would then continue our discussion with the Board of Selectmen on the 8th on the Board of Selectmen sponsored articles. Um, I believe we have confirmed that the Capital Planning Improvement Committee, Capital Improvement Planning Committee is coming in that night and we'll, we'll um, discuss any other budgets that we haven't already discussed. We'll effectively have discussed them because we'll have voted, I hope, on the contingent and non-contingent scenarios. But if there's, I want to make reference to the Warren Committee and a, and a few other budgets that we haven't gotten to yet. Um, we'll then come back on the 13th and um, I'm basically holding that date. It's possible that we won't need to have budget wrap discussions on um, the 15th, but if we come back on the 13th, process through anything that we haven't finished on the contingent, non-contingent, we have the Blue Hills discussion, make that vote or push that vote off to the 15th, present the budget back uh, to the town on the 15th the way that we have it voted, um, and the budget could be finalized on March 15th if everything goes according to plan. If we have additional delays, or you want to spend more time having discussions, um, or want to revisit things, we have two other meetings where we can be making uh, changes. But the warrant will be like 95% written by the time we get to March 15th. And we'll, have be, we'll be sending a draft at that point, and changes that we make hopefully after that will be minimal. Questions on the schedule? Does anybody think it's unreasonable the way it's laid out? Any concerns? I did like someone mentioned the idea of Saturday just getting it all done. We don't do that anymore? It was done before I joined the Warrant oh. Committee, so I didn't have the perspective that that was a good way to do it. I didn't know one way or the other. It sounds... I used to be on... That's a full day. Ted used to refer to it as the all-day meeting, yeah. and mm -hmm. we didn't do it the last three years. So maybe next year's Warrant Committee will want to discuss... If, if there's a contingent budget especially, maybe next year's Warrant Committee will want to discuss the possibility of having that all-day meeting. If there aren't as severe cuts, two years ago Ted determined, you know, we're not making any cuts. Why would we have this all-day meeting? So that's why we didn't have it, and I didn't think that to go back before my time to say, how was it done? Was anyone here when they had the Saturday meetings? Yeah. Did you get a lot accomplished? <clears throat> it was like the final day wrap up and you were making your final votes and the department heads had one more opportunity to come in and talk about anything that they had, you know, make their presentation or anything that had changed. So. And people still could come in and do that on the 15th when we present back what our final numbers are. Any other questions? Chuck? Second. Motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Very adjourned. <laughs>